Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Treon White. I'm the Ward 8 Council Member and also the Chair of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. Today is Wednesday, February the 1st, 2023. We are remotely meeting using the Zoom platform. The time is now 2 o'clock p.m. And we are calling, sorry, we are calling to order this performance oversight hearing on the Committee for DC Public Library System. Uh, the DC Public Libraries was created in 1896 by Act of Congress. The library was established as an independent agency that would serve as the People's University. The DC Public Library supports residents with services, programming, books, and a host of other materials that align with what we call Know Your Neighbor Strategic Plan, which encourages libraries to customize their services to reflect the unique communities they serve to include an emphasis on advancing equity amongst all residents, especially among those with limited or complete without access to DC Public Library resources. This is accomplished by our prioritizing reading, digital citizenship, strong communities, and local history and culture. The DC Public Library is comprised of a central library and 25 neighborhood libraries, including library services inside the DC jail. Most Library buildings are flexible by design to accommodate a variety of programs to support community learning. The library also continues to reach residents in non-traditional settings that include schools, restaurants, houses, uh, places of worship, and also online. Today is the first day of Black History Month. Notably, the DC Public Library has curated a list of titles for adults to explore Black uh, resistance um, in, in, in athleticism amongst uh, the Kaepernick effect, uh, taking a knee and changing the world by David Zirin and police brutality and white supremacy. The fight against American traditions by NBA veteran and social justice advocate, Eton Thomas. Let me check and see if any other members are present. I see we are joined by Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis George. Uh, th thank you. Um, my, I'm having issues with my video Zoom, so I'm just going to um, go from um, just try to stay off so that way it actually works. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman White, um, and thank you to um, our witnesses uh, for making time today to speak with us, uh, to speak with us. I'll be in and out of today's hearing but I'm here mostly to speak with and hear from Ward 4 residents about uh, their uh, feelings on uh, DC Public Library's proposed changes for Shepherd Park Library. Um, I've been adamant that any changes to the Shepherd Park Library, the Juanita Thornton Shepherd Park Library must be driven first with robust community engagement. Um, I appreciate Director Reyes Gavin and his team for the recent survey they've conducted about a proposed move of the library to new parks at Walter Reed development. Um, which I'm very, but I'm very concerned that we need to make sure Ward 4 community members from all neighborhoods get the opportunity to weigh in on the potential move before decisions are made. Um, I'm also adamant that the DC Public Library needs to not forget the service gap identified in their 2020 Master Facilities Plan, the next Libras. The report identified Brightwood Park and Manor Park as areas greater than one mile from a library with a high concentration of individuals, and I quote, with low educational attainment, children ages birth to nine, uh, and single parent households, this community would greatly benefit from a new full service library. And we cannot forget them and our needs. The idea that, um, that we uh, cannot find a solution for the families of Brightwood Park and Manor Park um, does not make sense to me. Um, and the idea that a Shepherd Park Library moving to Walter Reed would serve the uh, residents of Brightwood Park in Manor Park is also nonsensical to me. Um, as I grew up in what is considered Manor Park off of Kennedy Street, um, and the idea that Walter Reed is is in, is anywhere close to Ken, is anywhere close to Kennedy Street to service those neighbors, um, in, in my opinion. Uh, does not does not make sense for those neighbors. It also doesn't take into consideration um, who those neighbors are. We have high concentrations of apartment buildings um, in the Brightwood Park and Manor Park area. Um, in addition, with multi families living in those apartment buildings from one bedroom, two bedroom, we have 
um, school communities in those areas, school communities that are not necessarily neighborhood schools after the closing of Rudolph Elementary, Keene, Rabot, schools of that, uh, schools, uh, we do not have um, the supports that we need and never have had. And so the idea that Brightwood Park and Manor Park um, uh, families, many of those families are uh, multi-generational families. Um, many of those families are uh, Ethiopian, uh, Latino, uh, Spanish speaking, um, hard speaking uh, generations of, of families there that could and would benefit uh, from the library being located in Brightwood Park and Manor Park. That's why I've been pushing DC Public Library and the mayor to embrace a two library solution. We must not accept that one community must lose for another community to gain, and I believe we can do better. So I'm here today to listen to residents and speak with DCPL leadership primarily on this issue, but also other issues we may hear from residents. So thank you, Chairman White, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Councilman Lewis George. We're also joined by Ward 3 Councilmember Matt Fruman. Matt, do you have an opening statement? Thank you, Chairman White. I, White, I, uh, I'll be very brief. I, I'm here, as Councilmember Lewis George was just saying, um, in large part to listen and, uh, and learn from the, both the residents and the testimony of the director of DCPL. Um, the uh, issues that are on my mind include, and these will come up in the conversation, you know, the plans for the Chevy Chase Civic Corps, which will call for the remaking of the library. I'm curious how um, how the director is thinking about that process and what we can do to make sure that there's a great library. I'm, I'm particularly interested in libraries. I mean, for many, many people, libraries are a lifeline um, that are and a pathway to opportunity. One of those was my mother. Um, whose childhood was uh, transformed by access to a library near her. And so, as Councilmember Lewis George was saying, the importance of having great libraries in every community um, is a high priority for me. I have not really looked over the landscape to know where there are gaps in that coverage, but if there are gaps, I, I share the hope that we can fill them. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will call our first panel of witnesses. And as we do that, um, they will be promoted um, to the screen. We have a tight schedule and requested all witnesses ahead to their allotted time. All public witnesses appearing on their own behalf will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to testify. Public witnesses that who are elected to represent others are testifying in their official capacity. Um, will be allotted five minutes uh, to testify. With that being said, we wanna welcome um, everyone uh, to this very important discussion on libraries in Washington, D.C. Um, so the first panelist will be uh, ANC 5 do 2 Commissioner, Sabrina Rhodes, uh, Friends of Cromwell, Cromwell, Brenda Ingram. Yeah, we're here. Ask for me local 1808 member, Matthew Williams. Library Renaissance Project leader, Robin Denier. Um, yes, I'm here, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, Friends of Shepherd Park and Juanita Thornton Library, Mark Patterson. So we'll start with uh, Commissioner Rhodes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member White and all the witnesses that are here. Uh, my name is Sabrina Rhodes. I'm a Ward 5 resident of Ivy City and native to the district. I'm serving in my second term as ANC 5D02. I'm also a community organizer with Empower DC here in Ivy City and a member of Friends of Carmel. I'm testifying on behalf of Empower DC. Today, we appreciate your continued support, Council Member White, and would you please continue to advocate for the renovation of Cromel? As you're aware, Mayor Bowser put $20 million in a budget in 2021 for renovations of the, the Cromel site to be a community center um, slash recreation center. 
The process has started with the architectural engineer being chosen and an upcoming community engagement meeting planned with DPR and DGS on February 10th. The last time we testified last year, we weren't sure if we would have the entire two acres for recreational programs, indoor and outdoor amenities. We also testified to have a library at our newly renovated community center to be added as a resource, but we have not heard back on that. I'm hearing that a lot of youth aren't utilizing some of their neighborhood recreation centers because of no interest. Our community center will interest residents of all ages and the library will be an added asset. Having a small kiosk or a lending library now will give us a preview of what's to come. There are plenty of youth in Navi City who are still into holding actual books and having a cozy area to read them. Having computers and internet access is sometimes a challenge with some families staying at school late to do homework or walking to uh, Woolridge Library, which is the closest, with, and it's too far. Youth these days want options that appeal to them. A library is a healthy choice, offering more of a variety of healthy choices uh, for families will help change their way of thinking, especially for the younger generation. Our community has plenty of places to get alcohol, but no programming services. Nowhere to go to be creative, discover, and, and explore. We must invest in our youth and our families. Whatever we were doing in the past isn't working, and as we can see, we need to make more changes in our priorities, or we will continue to lose our children. Councilmember White, as I stated earlier in my testimony, you have invested and advocated for the Ivy City community before. We're asking you for your continued support in advocating for more funding in the renovation of Premel, a small library that will serve our residents until Premel is renovated, and a full service library for our newly renovated community center when it's finished. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Um, Ms. Brenda Ingram is here. She's going to do her testimony as well. Okay, perfect. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Brenda Ingram. I am testifying on behalf of Empower DC and the Friends of Cromwell. We have no library services or programming here in Ivy City. At our clubhouse, we can sponsor a library locker and or story time for a couple times a month or more, depending on the children's interests. The Ivory City Clubhouse serves as a place the children can come for snacks, events, and activities. Former ANC Commissioner Lining Hands basketball court <laughs> is still on the premises so all ages can gather to participate and do various activities. Once Carmel is open, we can transfer these services over to our new community center, which would have been put in place and is part of what our community offers. We want to be a part of Parks and Rec's master plan. Comments submitted. It will be community-led, inclusive, creative, and fun. This is how we will get the residents engaged and participants in uplifting our neighborhood. A child's development and family involvement in their neighborhood is what influences how a child grows. And we are advocating for drastic environmental change in our community. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Um, we move to Matthew Williams. Ask me local 1808. Greetings, uh, Chairman White and members of the committee. 
My name is Matthew Williams, and I serve as the president for the American Federal State Council Municipal Employees ASME, Local 18, 1808. That represents the DC Public Library Service employees, professional and paraprofessionals. I've been employed and proudly served at DCPL just shy of 20 years. I've served now for nearly two years as local president, and unfortunately, I missed the budget hearing. Yet I'll be remiss not to applaud the council and mayor on the major increase in the budget for DC Public Libraries. Thank you. We believe that we, DCPL, are the heartbeat of the city, serving everyone from every background with their desires to gain information, knowledge, and pathways to literacy that at times can be ever so elusive. The DC Public Library is committed again to offering services across the city until 9 p.m., four nights a week, a commitment we have, attained, we have not attained since the inception of the COVID-19 pandemic. We as dedicated public servants rose to the occasion in November of 2022, braving many unknowns similar to when we reopened in the midst of COVID pandemic. Yet we find ourselves and the staff at our locations awaiting the influx of new highest promise that will boast our ranks to provide the support we, as employees, need to provide our library patrons. We also have major concerns with the work-life balance of our members, some with young families, due to extensive uh, due, due to the extended out service hours exacerbated by the lack of FTEs not in place. We also would like to bring attention to the host for continued dedication to the library to help provide passage wage to superior customer service to our library patrons by providing more opportunities for growth of our current public service through trainings, skills, and tuition reimbursement programs for our members to gain the education to continually provide to all. These programs to promote upward mobility have not been fully in place for many years. We believe that this can combat the massive numbers and employee turnover that we are facing at DCPL. Another point to bring to the attention of the, of the committee is the public safety of our library locations, including patrons and employees alike. The incidents at our locations have risen just as the crime in our streets have. The comp to complement to the, to the later hours has rendered many anxious about their safety at our locations. We need enhancements in this area to better provide safety at our locations. Listed below are a few. More police cars to patrol the branches and respond to complaints in a timely fashion. More personnel to either help with the patrol or be posted at all locations. More training opportunities for all DC public police officers. Admin access to the camera systems to allow internal surveillance. An internal automated door system for branches with multi-level facilities. We believe these enhancements are critical to provide the standard of security and public safety that will bring more patrons, employees, into our locations and likewise into our ranks. Our final concern relates to improvements to the facilities framework and the utilization of contractors at DCPL. Some very glaring things have been left unchecked resulting in a lack of usage for members of our disabled and special needs community without access to some of the facilities, most notably the elevator outage at Woodridge Library that spanned five months. Other issues like pest control, bed bugs most notably, and HVAC, HVAC, especially in the cooling season, have caused major inconveniences to our colleagues and our patrons. We implore the committee to heavily consider these suggestions as the passions of our employees are second to none, yet the health and safety of our members and patrons will inevitably be at risk with inaction. I am with a quote from Henry Peter Braw, education makes the people easy to lead but difficult to drive, easy to govern, but impossible to enslave. With the utmost respect, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Appreciate your leadership. We're gonna go uh, right to Ms. Robin Dina. You're still muted. There we go. There we go. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Great testimony so far. 
Um, I'm Robin Diener, Director of the Library Renaissance Project and President uh, right now of the MLK Library Friends. As always, we appreciate being heard by this committee. Uh, first, just a few words as President of MLK Friends. We want everyone to know that DCPL is providing an extraordinary amount of wonderful programming at MLK. I recall a recent evening when I was in the lobby to direct attendees to our own friends meeting, which was on the lower level, but I was besieged by all kinds of people of all ages looking for other programs that were to take place, maybe four or five different ones. So it was really thrilling to see so much going on. And it's like that, frankly, day after day, they're doing really great work. It's a wonderful accomplishment because libraries in general across our city at the branches, but also around the country are still struggling to bring everyone back after the pandemic. People don't wanna be in the public space as much. But downtown, this neighborhood that I believe our mayor mistakenly called a dead zone um, is going full steam. And there are lots of people at the MLK library. So I just think bravo to the library staff and administration for what they're doing there at MLK. Now, back to the Library Renaissance Project. We've testified many times against the privatization of public property. PPPs, as they are called, are problematic. So far, during the transformation of the DC Public Library, we have seen only one public-private partnership consummated, if you will, the West End. Um, and the DCPO leadership has maintained that they are fine with the PPP, but we're not sure that their view represents the library going public, who could not go to the library for two months last year after a privately owned luxury condo overhead flooded the library and the cafe next door. Now we've never seen an accounting of the damages uh, to my knowledge, but being closed for two months is hard to put a price on. It affects thousands of users. So flooding from those overhead units is but one reason that we oppose the PPPs, but we know, uh, and we know a PPP was originally planned for the MLK uh, renovation, but was ultimately dismissed as not financially viable. And I think we should reread that study. The architect of the award-winning design for the MLK renovation, Francine Hubin, has said in print that she was glad the library decided not to do housing as the uses, housing and library, are not compatible. There is a lot of discussion needed with the public and the administration if the city intends to go forward with more PPPs. Um, now, in Chevy Chase and Ward 3, extensive public engagement was held to create a small area plan for three blocks of Connecticut Avenue known um, as the uh, Civic Core, which includes the library, and the small area plan was passed by uh, the DC Council. So in spite of so many people having given uh, input at meetings over, I think, 18 months, Residents were surprised to learn in November that the Civic Core, which includes the library, was to be surplused. And this is defined as no longer needed for public purpose. In fact, we might be surprised to learn that the word surplus does not appear in the small area plan, which by the way is the Office of Planning, not DCPO. But um, in shock at this idea of surplusing their library and rec center, more than 200 residents turned out to give testimony and hear testimony, which is almost entirely in opposition to surplusing. So the Library Renaissance Project continues to oppose surplusing that will result in a PPP, even if it would retain land for the library, like the West End Condo Library. There are many ways to keep the land in public ownership while addressing the elements requested in the small area plan. We recommend that a design direct uh, process be undertaken to explore the possibilities for improving the Civic Core, um, which includes alternatives for adding housing, affordable housing on the land, as was considered in the SAP, as well as additional public uses like um, a senior center and um, a daycare. 
And then I would just like to note that no one from the Chevy Chase Library Friends was on the advisory group for the Chevy Chase Small Area Plan. I, again, I don't know, it seems like an oversight, but I don't really know who's responsible, but I think we should always look to include the Friends representative in, in things that include libraries. And then lastly, um, I must call this committee's attention to the difficulties that have been ongoing now with regard to contracts that the Friends of the Library and other local groups and nonprofits have had to sign in order to hold meetings at the public. And libraries are expressly designed to, it, to enable people to have meetings. Um, these contracts indemnify the public library, which is an institution that sees the coming and going of thousands of people every day without contracts, but yet holds responsible the friends in these small local groups. Now, I have been advised that these contracts are unenforceable by law, but they certainly are unwarranted and they discourage the use of the library by the very patrons it was designed to serve. And just to clarify, I do not think this is a DCPL requirement that they invented. I believe that it is a district-wide legal requirement. And as it affects the library, this must be changed, council member. Um, I don't know uh, what you can do with that. We need to look at that regulation and where it's coming from. The DC Public Library, as Mr. Williams was saying, it's the agency closest to the people, closest to the most people and to the greatest diversity of people across the city in all ages and walks of life. Um, and if I may just add, council member, I saw you at the Thou Shalt Not Kill poster launch. And it seems to me, I haven't brought this up with the library and I don't know if this is being done throughout the library system, but it seems like something that could have a place at our libraries. Um, and, and thank you for doing that. I think it's a completely wonderful idea. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll come back with some comments and questions. Now we hear from Mark Patterson, of friends of Shepherd Park and Juanita Thornton Library. Okay, I don't see Mark at all. Give him a few more seconds. Okay. Yeah. Hearing none. All right, so we'll jump back up real quick and then we ask a few questions, have some dialogue and go to the next panel. I want to start with you, uh, Miss Rhodes. Um, yes. Real quick, how far uh, is the Woodbridge Library um, from Cromwell area? And what's the expected date of completion for the, that they told you for the Cromwell Library? Woodridge Library is up um, on Rhode Island Avenue, and we're all the way here. I don't have the exact miles. Yeah, I got you. We but, yeah, yeah, but it's... But you're saying it's not walkable? It, no. It's not walkable, but we do have a family that walks there, um, a dad that takes his daughter. You have their testimony as well takes his daughter to Woodridge and they walk. So basically from here, you will have to walk, you have to cross New York Avenue, go up towards uh, Brentwood, is that what do you say? 18, 18, and then you can get the library from there, but it's still a long, dangerous walk. Long walk. Mm -hmm. Get it. Oh, and then 18. And um, we have a proposed date of 2024. They haven't start, started anything except for the negotiation process with the architectural engineer. But they were supposed to have began in the fall of 22. So we, we're expecting it to be open 2024, uh, give or take a few months. But that's um, that's what we're thinking. Okay, and I also heard you, Miss Ingram, um, talking about uh, we need to add the this 
these wrecks to the master plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we already submitted the comments to the um, to Office of Planning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we already met with them. And ready to play as well. And I heard you talk about additional funding for Cremel. Um, what would that entail? I thought we had added more money at some point. We we don't know for sure if more money has been added. All we know of is 20 million. Um, when the New York Avenue Vision Framework um, meeting, community meeting the other night, they had said something about adding additional funds because since COVID, the amount of um, the materials cost more, so they will have to add more funding. But we, the, the school's been closed for 40 years. So mm -hmm. we're not sure, it's a historic landmark. So the, the building, the structure of the building is gonna remain. We're just not sure if the 20 million will cover the, the cost of renovating the building, plus the amenities, indoor amenities, and the outdoor amenities. Got it. Um, Kyle, could you start my timer for this? I can know where I am. Um, you said in your testimony that you had not heard back um, regarding your request. Uh, what, what, was, what was the request and when did you send it? <laughs> we testified last year <laughs> and we asked for a a temporary library locker or kiosk for the, the Ivy City Clubhouse so that we can begin services until Fermel is opened up. A temporary locker? What, what, what do you mean? Well, a locker or a lending library, some kind of library services where the children and the community can come. They can get the books from here, from the Ivy City Clubhouse. Okay, I got you. So yeah, I know they. I know we've done some of those tree boxes and some of those uh, temporary library spaces and just being creative in ways to get people access to reading material. So I guess that's, yeah. yeah, that's what we want to do. And then when Formel is open, we want to transfer the services over there. All right. Um, I guess one of the recurring things that I'm hearing. Um, is even during Mr. Williams' testimony, he can speak to this, but is the concern of safety um, at, uh, you know, our libraries, our recreation centers. Um, have you all seen or experienced or, or any of that? And that's open to anyone on the, on the Zoom. You're talking to us or Mr. Williams? Uh, both. I mean, all, because, you know, he mentioned it, but I, I, I heard you talk about the distance and traveling and going there, and I know one of the issues, especially when our young people, yeah. most of the young people's access to facilities, but also access to safe communities. Well, um, we haven't, like like I was saying, Cremel isn't open yet. So we're working with Tommy Jones and, and a team with DPR to make sure that, and that's something that I added to the pay, play, play, what is it, the uh, ready to play um, comments that we have cameras and once the, the community center opens up that we have um, security. Uh, we don't, the only thing that's open over there, um, as you're aware, is the basketball courts and the playground. Um, we do need cameras, but in order to have the cameras, we need internet service. But the families that are walking to Woodbridge, yeah, if, if if we had the library services here in Ivy City, then they wouldn't have to walk that far. And plus they're giving the star construction everywhere. So this is just dangerous. I got you. Ms. Mr. Williams, did you have something specific as relates to public safety, um, as you mentioned in your testimony? Yes, sir, Chairman White. Uh, we had a very uh, extremely uh, terrible incident, I think uh, the 23rd, right before uh, the Christmas weekend. Uh, where it was an altercation between two patrons. It was a physical altercation, a fight was going on, and then it led to another altercation. Where, where was DCF. this? 
this is at Woodridge Neighborhood Library Store. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it it was very terrible. Uh, the and that it, MPD actually had to come onto the scene to uh, arrest this gentleman. Uh, it was it. so, uh, and we've had uh, uh, sh- shootings right outside our facilities. Um, <clears throat> uh, also, uh, acts of violence uh, where uh, as patrons have attacked employees um, at various locations throughout the city. One is southwest. Uh, so there, there are things that, that we're definitely concerned about, which, which being either uh, public safety, public services, public officers at our locations, and better, better things, so uh, they can do their job more accordingly and and provide a safe environment for not only employees but also the patrons. Got it. Let me ask. Um... I'll ask this to a director um, about security and our working relationship with community organizations and MPD as relates to safety, because it's a reoccurring thing that's coming up all the time. May I mention one more thing? Um, We did have some canopies put over the playgrounds for um, shading in the summertime. And the canopies are blocking the street lights that are that are were used to lighten up the playground when the sun goes down. So we still have people come on the playground, but the canopies are blocking the light, so it's extra dark. Got it. I'm running out of time for this panel, but I want to jump to you, um, Ms. Robin. Uh, where are we? Um, has any part of the library been restored since it's flooded? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The library is completely back in operation. It was closed for two months, but it was then fully operable afterwards at the West End. Okay. Um, so, so my point, I'm sorry, I mean, it just seems like a small thing and people have told me that, oh, well, that can happen, but it doesn't have to happen to our public uses, which it's not just one family or one apartment being inconvenienced, it's thousands of people every day. So I would just advise that we look very carefully at any public-private partnerships that involve housing and uses with so much plumbing over a library. Yeah. And I think someone mentioned about the contracting. Um, yes. And you, you stated that this is, oh yeah, that was you. You stated that this is may not be a DC public library thing, but it may be a DC government thing. I have my staff, we will look into that. And if something we uh, can change that works uh, as a reasonable solution, we'll do that. Um, but what that would be it? great because I feel like the staff sort of throws up their hands a little bit. They are almost as much put upon as we are, but they can't control it. How does the the contracts create barriers for, I guess, a working relationship or the flow of, uh, you know, services? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Yeah, so you you said the contracts contracts, uh, is an issue. Uh, What is the issue with the contracts? Well, the contract requires the group to sign off and indemnify DCPL for anything, or and I guess the DC government, I, I should know, but I don't know the exact wording, um, against anything that might happen when so it's the library is open contract. all day to everyone. So is, it, is the contract it speaks to liability? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I'm... The group has the liability, not the library. Okay. You know, and we're talking about book signings and gardening lectures and uh, maybe a meeting of the friends or or DC for Democracy recently tried to do something. Also, the contracts are a little bit expensive. The costs are a little bit expensive for some groups. Although I will say that the Board of Library Trustees has taken a look at reducing those prices. So they're aware. But the general complexity of this contracting is just so unnecessary. What, do you share what the pricing is and who has to get paid? What's that process? Okay, so that's that's different. So like the uh, 
and I'm sorry, I confused the two. Uh, DC for Democracy, I think. And I think someone is gonna speak from that group later. Um, Alex Dodds, she may address that, but uh, we too have looked at uh, having an event and unless it's sponsored by the government, um, there, there are costs. And you oh, know, you're we built contracts and using space. If somebody rent a space, yeah. and you have to yeah. sign a contract to use the space. Therefore, you're liable if you have to pay a fee to use the space. And you're saying that, you know, uh, you're saying that the organization shouldn't assume liability, and you're saying the pricing is too expensive. Yes, two completely separate things. I'm sorry, I confused those council member. Yes. Okay. Okay, we have to look at that to see why that is in place. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that would be so great. Thank you. Written out of space. Um, and could I just add, as long as you have me, um, the Library Renaissance Project has um, proposed library services at Cremel for years now. So we completely agree with those witnesses. Um, and we have talked to the library about, you know, a program of library services that takes less real estate. Um, and I would love to see DCPL look at that again. I would be very happy to work with them. And then I also want to say with regard to the two library solution in um, Ward 4 regarding Shepherd Park and possible Brightwood, we agree with the two library solution. I understand that one of the major reasons people like the idea of Walter Reed is that there's a lot of parking. Yeah, I'm and, over my time, so I have to- Oh, I'm you. sorry. I got one last question for you, Mr. Williams. Um, how many FTEs do you believe is needed to be efficient? Uh, for us, on the public service side, I believe we need to bolster the ranks by at least a number 70, uh, another 70 people. Um, Additional 70? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that goes, that goes along with uh, the need of people we need for public safety and the need of people we need for, uh, for public services. We are, we are really struggling over here to really try to keep this thing going. And, we, and we're offering great service. All right. Yeah, if you can send us something about you know what those workers will be doing, just kind of like a roadmap of what you know that'll give us a bit greater understanding of what we are advocating for. I uh, thank you guys for joining us today and adding value to this conversation. Indeed, uh, sir. Thank you. Greater yeah. and more access to public libraries in District of Columbia. And we move to our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We have. Chris Auden, DC for Reasonable Development, Brittany Wade, Wade Education Services, Zachary Israel, Ryan Linham, and Alex Dodds. I think that uh, Mark Patterson joined on as well, so we can elevate Mark. If he is here, uh, does any other council members have any questions? I'm sorry, I didn't realize you guys were still on. Um, not for the last panel, but I probably will have some for the next this next panel coming up. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Otter, you can go right ahead to start this next panel. Council Member White, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Um, thanks for hosting this uh, important meeting. Obviously, DC Public Libraries are our permanent uh, institution of education, lifelong institution of education. So important to so many communities around the city. Um, I, I want to focus in. I've been using the Martin Luther King uh, Laboratories, the Fab Lab. Uh, excellent, excellent resources. Um, really want to promote those and more funding for that. I noticed, for example, in the memory lab, some of the older equipment that, I mean, it might be new in the library, but it's old equipment because it's old tech. We're trying to get eight millimeter digital tape or film onto, onto the computers. Um, these things break and it doesn't seem like there's a fund to help either repair 
maybe we could even do it in the lab, repair together with some teens or, or teachers or whatever, um, uh, or, or just buy new stuff. So like the eight millimeter camera is not there right now. And I know that's a big loss. Uh, I'm not sure if the laser cutter is back online. I know they had issues with uh, some of the venting for that, but that's a big thing. I know a lot of students like there's stencil cutting for artists. Um, that seems not to be up yet, but maybe maybe it is. Um, and and things speaking of things being down, I do want to flow from Miss Deaner's uh, uh, comments. You know, two months of a library closure may not matter in West End so much. Um, I, I'm not one to judge that, but potentially co-mingled libraries where you have a library with housing on top in uh, let's say Ward 7 or 8, and that library has to shut down for two months uh, where the value of that library uh, in, in a, in a, as a social and community resource at being closed, it's just unacceptable. I, I would like to quote the architect of the MLK renovation, Francine Hubin of Mecano, who in the February 2022 issue of the World Architect said, I never thought it was a good idea to add a residential volume on this particular public building. A library, a public building has very different ownership, maintenance, and sustainability issues than a residential building. In the end, the library canceled that idea and changed direction. I think it was a good decision. I think we need to ensure that public access to public libraries, you know, if it's to be commingled with anything, it's to be commingled with other public things like public rec centers or public community centers that we can get in and fix and repair right away and not see closed for two months. I think it's not hard to do that, but mixing with housing, it's just some things don't mix. And you know, um, the accountability around that, I don't know, I could, I'd be glad to send you the notice that DC put out, DCPL put out about it when that happened at the West End. I mean, just real short, kind of trying to dodge accountability, sort of like how they've kind of dodged the accountability around the behind the scenes name, uh, naming of the MLK Library Auditorium for Jeff Bezos. I mean, there has to be accountability to these decisions. Um, and we don't want to see libraries co closed uh, due to the decision to put housing on top. So I'll just leave it at that. Some land uses don't mix. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, next we have, I go, sorry, go back to Mark Patterson, Friends of Shepherd Park when he's in our library. Mark, I'm sorry. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Account Chairman White and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to give testimony. My name is Mark Pattison. I'm the president of the Friends of the Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library. Those of you who have served on this committee for the past two years have heard me testify about keeping the library serving our community open. In contrast to DCPL's recommendation in its master facilities plan, Next Libris, to close it down. Our advocacy over these past two years must have had some effect because last month, DCPL Executive Director Richard reyes Gavilan announced an effort to place a new library on the grounds of the old Walter Reed Army Medical Center. But he said, first, we're going to do a survey of the community with an online survey monkey survey. I don't know about you, but I would not make a survey monkey survey the basis for a $25 billion construction job. It is, as they say, unscientific. And critics will say that the questions are self-justifying so as to gain the desired outcome. To the friends of the library, any proposed site in Walter Reed deserves at least the same degree of scrutiny that the Shepherd Park friends gave Next Libris. And the current building housing the Shepherd Park Library deserves the same scrutiny. On January 19th, the Friends of the Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library unanimously adopted a resolution calling for a rigorous independent study to assess the current library and any new site at Walter Reed. Pros and cons, the advantages and drawbacks. For example, we need to determine the economic impact of moving the library. What will it mean for businesses inside Walter Reed? What will it mean for Georgia Avenue's businesses? 
what would be the fate of the late Sam Gilliam's installation, District Stars, District Bars, which is affixed to the exterior front wall of the existing library. The two ANC commissioners whose territory dovetails with the Shepherd Park Library's coverage area agree and will introduce their version of this resolution when Advisory Neighborhood Commission 4A meets next Tuesday, February 7th. A copy of the Friends resolution will accompany my testimony. One question that needs to be answered is why DCPL feels the need to build a new library a few blocks from an existing and eminently serviceable library. It's true that all buildings have a natural life, but our library isn't even 33 years old yet. But until that study is conducted, all we'll have is guesswork and conjecture. However, it is telling to note that DCPL ignored one of its own next leapers recommendations at the starting gate. Shepherd Park was supposed to be in the first group of branch libraries to get its electrical, lighting, internet, Wi-Fi, and other systems upgraded. The cost for that runs in the six figures, not the eight figures for a new library. Now, in a time when other communities leaders see libraries as something to curtail and censor, we in the district do a pretty good job of celebrating libraries. We are concerned that without an impartial study, the Shepherd Park community, which fought so hard in the 1980s to get this library, could be split into two camps. Now, the Friends of the Library's position is the same as that of Council Member Janice Lewis George. When she first voiced it even before she was sworn in, keep the library in Shepherd Park and build a new library for the underserved Manor Park, Brightwood Park community. Next Libras itself talks about building library system, quote, responsibly and equitably, unquote. However, when Richard Reyes Gavilan said January 9th in his Walter Reed pitch, and I quote again, no new net libraries, does that mean that Manor Park and Brightwood Park will keep getting the short end of the stick? That would constitute an even more egregious sloughing off of DCPL's master plan. DCPL put together that plan with lots of recommendations and followed up with boasts that all those recommendations had approved, been, been approved by the mayor, yet it doesn't fund its own recommendations. How responsible and equitable is that? If DCPL can forecast capital costs five years out, Shouldn't it have the capability to forecast staffing and maintenance costs eight or nine years out? Some questions need a study to answer, but for other issues, you don't need to take a poll to learn the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Brittany Wade. Oh, let's see Ms. Wade here, so I'll correct me if I'm wrong. I'm moving right along. Mr. Israel. Thank you, Chair White, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Zach Israel. I'm a former ANC 4D commissioner. Um, so in November 2020, DCPL identified in its 10 year facilities master plan six geographic areas where district residents, quote, do not have the same level of service as in other areas. One of those identified areas is Brightwood Park and Manor Park, the former of which is located within the current boundaries of ANC 4D, where I served as a commissioner in 2021 and 22. The plan further states that while these neighborhoods are, quote, located between four libraries, Shepherd Park, Tacoma Park, Lamont Riggs, and Petworth, the closest one is approximately one mile away. Furthermore, quote, the area is made up primarily of single family row houses and other low to medium density housing. This area has a high concentration of individuals with low educational attainment, children ages birth to nine, and single parent households. Additionally, there are a lot of individuals living in the area who do not currently use the library and have the potential to become customers. Expanding library services to this area may relieve pressure on the services of the Petworth Library nearby. As indicated by Ward 4 Councilmember Lewis George in her opening statement today, the only community engagement conducted by DCPL to date regarding a new library in Ward 4 has been an online survey asking Ward 4 residents for their feedback on the possible relocation of the Shepherd Park Library to the new Walter Reed Development, which is located approximately one and a half to two miles away from many parts of Brightwood Park and Manor Park. There is virtually no mention of these two neighborhoods in this online survey. I find it frustrating and baffling that the very first instance of DCPLA community engagement on this topic of a new library in Ward 4 
leaves out any mention of the very neighborhoods the library identified as needing a new library. I appreciate Director Reyes Gavilan speaking to ANC4D at our public meeting last March to discuss this topic. And on April 20th of last year, uh, ANC4D unanimously passed a resolution urging DCPL in part to begin its community engagement with ANC4D and Brightwood Park residents regarding the new public library as expeditiously as possible, ideally beginning in the fall of 2022. This will allow ample time for DCPLA to design to begin design and construction three years ahead of its proposed schedule. However, ANC4D never received a response to our resolution last year, and there still has been no community engagement with our neighborhood to date. Per district law, DCPLA must provide great weight to the recommendations outlined by ANC4D in the resolution passed last April, and I truly hope it does so. We need the library to conduct robust community engagement in Brightwood Park and Manor Park in the very near future regarding residents' thoughts on the new library in our part of Ward 4. And this community engagement must be more than an online survey to ensure that all members of our community have a real opportunity to participate in the process. This includes physical flyering, mailers, and outreach to businesses and agencies 4B and 4D in order to get as many people involved as possible. We don't have an existing Friends of a Library organization, so our neighborhoods are inherently at a disadvantage when it comes to advocacy on this particular issue. So I urge you and other community members to ask the director about his commitment uh, to build a new library in our part of Ward 4 and for his uh, ideas for uh, community engagement in our neighborhood. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Um, Ryan Lehman. I see Ryan. I see Ryan here. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Councilmember White, how are you doing? I'm well and yourself. How are you? So you got the little one with you. Yeah, yeah, things are changing. So uh, I, I, I come before you to, to ask for the same things I, I've testified before. Um, now with more urgency, I have my own little one that I'm now looking out for. Um, but I want to see the kids that are growing up in Ivy City, um, yeah. some that have already gone off to college, um, actually see um, our requests actually uh, come into uh, reality. Um, I, as uh, Commissioner Rhodes has said, uh, as Ms. Ingram has said, uh, it, we, need the, we need the immediate activation. Um, the kids are, are still, they see that the basketball courts, um, lighting is an issue. Um, there are a couple lights that hang over the basketball courts that are just, they just don't turn on. Um, so some kids don't feel comfortable going there after dark. Um, now that it's winter, it, it's dark pretty early, um, but, um, in regards to today's hearing, um, I, I was just having a conversation with my, my wife earlier this week about bringing Julia here to a story time at, at a public library. And um, I, I share the same sentiment with everyone else in Ivy City that um, we need something here um, that is walkable. Um, the closest library is, a, is at, at least a 30 minute walk um, if you were to go up on, on Rhode Island. Uh, again, that would not be a safe walk for any kid. Um, I wouldn't even feel comfortable myself walking that far. Uh, definitely no easy bike lanes, but uh, I, I think that what we've seen with Empower DC um, and their continued efforts in Ivy City, uh, there is a space that can host um, that, that library service right here at where we sit. Um, also, there is a, a space um, on the Cromwell School lot that we've proposed in the past that uh, was like the entrance way for the, uh, I guess the planned bus lot that was there. Um, there is an air conditioning in, uh, inside of that. So it could be a temporary uh, service, but I know many community members feel comfortable and safe coming to uh, community center as we've called it um, as an interim host for library services, maybe a weekly story time for, for young kids. Um, but I uh, would love to, see your continued support um, for Ivy City. Uh, appreciate it when you come out like you had last year. Love to see you again. Um, but I wanna see uh, Ivy City kids uh, get what they deserve. Thank you. I look forward to following up with that. I did hear about the lighting on the courts to so we'll ping DGS as well. Um, next we have Alex Dodds.
I don't see Alex here. Um, I have a number of questions. Council member Lewis George, do you want to go with your questions? I go next. I know you've been waiting uh, for quite some time. Muted. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate that. Right. Um, I want to um, uh, thank um, Mark Patters Patterson and former commissioner, but community active community member Zach Israel for both of your testimonies. Um, Zach, I, I want to start with you, if I could. Um, after your initial, uh, after your uh, meeting, 4D um, DCPO had a meeting with 4D. Um, is it true, based on your under my um, your testimony, that no community meeting has happened um, in the Brightwood Park community with community members regarding um, a library since then? Yes, Councilmember Lewis George, that that is accurate. I mean, I. I... I have, was a commissioner from April when we passed the resolution of last year to December a month ago. And during that time, I never heard from the, exec the executive director or anyone else from DCPL as a sitting commissioner that serves Brightwood Park. So unless someone else was informed, I mean, I have, didn't see anything. So I don't think so. And commissioner, uh, could you tell me why um, Brightwood Park particularly would benefit from having libraries resources uh, in that community? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the master, the facilities master plan from the library itself outlines some of this, but um, on, on a broader level, as you well know, uh, having grown up in this area and all, all the challenges we faced over the, the last two years and even before then, um, our neighborhood, you know, has experienced a lot of gun violence, a lot of other violence, um, a lot of a lot of issues that have been ongoing in our, you know, systemic in nature. Um, and I really think that a, you know, a, a new uh, community resource like a library, it wouldn't help end all of those problems, but it really would serve as an anchor to support a lot of these people that are engaged in this violence and the community writ large. Um, and that's why I feel so passionately about this issue. And the fact, like I said in my testimony, we don't have an existing library. So it's, we're inherently at a disadvantage as a neighborhood to advocate coalesce around this issue. And that's why I'm speaking out today. Um, I, I really think that um, we could also incorporate other DC government uh, resources in this library. We could incorporate additional affordable housing. Um, I think Kennedy Street Corridor would be a great location for this, but if that's not possible, we'll take whatever we can get. But um, but we, we really do need the DCPL, I think, to step up its community engagement and answer questions about what's going on. And Commissioner, I appreciate that. And and actually, this summer, uh, DCPL did pop up libraries on Kennedy Street, um, and and came out um, to to Seventh uh, and Kennedy, and families came out in numbers. Diverse groups of family came out in numbers. So, uh, if they build it, community will come. Uh, in your resolution and your 4D resolution, did you all at all mention Walter Reed as uh, a, a location? for a Brightwood Park uh, library, service library? No, we did not. Okay. Um, and, and this um, resolution was unanimously passed by all the advisory neighborhood commissioners, including the 4D chair, uh, Renee Bowser. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, all right. Um, so thank, thank you, Commissioner. I, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate your testimony. Um, Mark Pattison, I wanna come over to you. Um, and can you uh, talk to me about uh, the importance of the Juanita Thornton Library in Shepherd Park and, and, and what resource it serves for your community? Well, we believe it serves as an economic anchor for the Georgia Avenue corridor above Walter Reed and probably into Walter Reed, such as it exists now. Uh, you know, wherever, you, wherever government commits money and resources, then other development will follow. And one business owner who's very loyal to Georgia Avenue said that she would probably have to close down if the library were to move into Walter Reed. Now, I'm skeptical about, you know, the um, possibility of moving into Walter Reed, but I'm willing to have my mind change if an impartial, independent, objective study is done. Um, but, you know, you can't fault a library for being where it is when you know, the district suggested putting it there in the first place. Correct. And um, 
was was uh, the Friends of group, were you all consulted before um, uh, Chair Reyes Gavilon and DCPL made a presentation at uh, Walter Reed about this new proposition to be moved there? I saw a notice on New Year's Eve on the Shepherd Park list, sir, that he had been in, or DCPL had been invited to speak at the, Wal at the Walter Reed Community Advisory Council meeting. So, of course, I had to tune in to see whether the invitation was going to be accepted. And then I learned what I learned. And uh, the representative uh, for Shepherd Park, who's on the Community Advisory Council, actually called my name out and said she hoped that I was there. And then there was a lot of Q&A and a lot of Q&A. And then that representative and I had a long talk on the phone that evening about the, the different yeah. issues involving a Walt Reed move. And the current survey is out. Um, is it your, your opinion that this is a uh, objective survey? No, it's not. It's not. And uh, I'm still waiting to see it in Amharic. And I even offered to take it to Ethiopian owned and run businesses all along the Georgia Avenue corridor as far south as Piney Branch Road, but I've yet to receive a response. I know it's out in Spanish now, but you know, there is a definite yeah. uh, Ethiopian community in Upper Georgia Avenue, uh, the northern Correct. corner of DC. Correct. The the Juanita Thornton Library actually does events, um, uh, host a re a read, hosted a reading series over the summer um, in, uh, in Amharic to support the families. Um, in in the Shepherd Park community, who who are um, Amharic speaking as their as their first language, and I don't know of any other library in the system that does offer any programming in Amharic. Correct, correct. Um, and uh, what do you? Um, what would good community engagement look like? Genuine community engagement look like with the Shepherd Park community regarding the Juanita Thornton Shepherd uh, Shepherd Park Library? I think. Um, a questionnaire restricted to the coverage area of the library would be the first step because that way you don't have people trying to influence or game the system to tell you what they want, regardless of what it is they want, that the people that that particular branch library is intended to serve get, you know, some and you know, offer straight answers and not necessarily multiple choice responses, fill in one or two as needed, you know, and that way it takes longer to process, but it's a more authentic and valuable way of discerning community's desires. And uh, and um, speaking of the, the current uh, Juanita Thornton uh, Shepherd Park Library, uh, which, which is a beautiful facility, however, what are some of the um, modernizations that need to happen uh, with, the, with that library uh, so that it could better serve our community? Well, yes, it could use an upgrade in electricity. It could use an upgrade in Wi-Fi. It can use better lighting. I've noticed uh, even the parking lot, you know, isn't always lit at night. I mean, that's an easily fixable solution. Um, the skylight doesn't leak anymore as it did for the first 20 or so years of the library's existence. That's good. Um, so we'd have to upgrade that. Um, and you could probably make some modifications to meeting room space to accommodate, to uh, take into account the new realities in our pandemic and post-pandemic world. Yeah. And and Mark, I want to be clear, uh, the, the friends the friends of uh, Juanita Thornton Shepherd Park Library, you all support um, a, a, a new library being built for the Manor Park and Brightwood Park community. I do. We do. I do. We do. Um, and we've held all along that it shouldn't be a, just helping to uh, uh, correct one anomaly or one deficiency in the district, but creating another one in return. And that's why I'm so concerned of when Richard Reyes Gavilan said, no, not new libraries. So, okay, mm -hmm. well, he's offering to build a new library for Walter Reed, but does that mean Banner Park and Brightwood Park get cut out of the equation? That seems to be a bit much to take because we've already yeah. got a library and don't have to spend any money except maybe an eight, a six figure outlay. Right. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. It, it, it doesn't make sense either. And, and Zachary, I'm just going to ask you, um, the, the, the um, Brightwood Park uh, community um, supports the Shepherd Park community having um, a library, an updated library that can serve their community as well. Am I correct? 
Yes, yes. We we don't want this to be an either or pitting one ward for a community against another. And 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 to Mark's point, I mean, I think I think this is doable. Um, and and we the money is there. Uh, we you know, maybe it'd be a little creative, but let's get it done. I, I think this can be done. So I hope the director is willing to do that. I agree, and I thank you both for your testimony. And, and I I look forward to asking um the director those questions as well. Thank you, thank you, Chairman White. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to jump back to Mr. Arden. Yeah. Oh, Council Member Fruman, do you have any questions? I actually do not. Last time um, when you started calling up the next panel, I thought, oh, you you didn't want to get questions from me. And so I stepped away for a moment. So I apologize for that. Uh, but I think that you have, between you and, and Council Member Lewis George, you've covered it very thoroughly from my perspective with these panels. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I want to jump back to you, uh, Mr. Otter. Is Are you still here? Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I heard you in your testimony talk about uh, how libraries and cohabiting with apartments don't mix. Uh, can you, you, I was trying to understand your reasoning. I think you said that some things just don't mix. Uh, do you have any clear examples of why they don't mix or what's the issue with that? Yeah, I just put in the chat the link uh, to, a, to a web page um, that we put up, just kind of um, trying to grapple with what the library, DCPL's uh, leadership apparently didn't want to really grapple with, which is the reality that the West End Library was closed for nearly two months because of plumbing issues with housing above it and the lack of access to it and then the damages and all of that. So it's just a it's just a, a clear example that when you commingle pri private housing, particularly which, as Robin Diener pointed out, has all the plumbing. I mean, if you put hundreds of units or even 50 units or even 25 units of housing above a library, you have 25 toilets, 25 sinks, 25, you know, I mean, there's just a lot more things that can go wrong above a public space. And, and you know, if you if that public space is affected, not for a day, not for three days, for almost two months, um, why is that an advantage to the public? And, you know, I mean, downplaying it as the library did over the over the springtime, you know, um, I don't know why they I mean, it, I, I guess they were embarrassed by it, but we don't want these decisions to keep happening this way. We could co-mingle libraries with other public needs, like like I pointed out with like a rec center, community center, archives, things that kind of make sense and more importantly things that public officials janitors repair people can get to quickly to fix yeah so i think about that and i mean i oversee uh recs as well as libraries and you typically recs allow basketball games sporting events people in and out doors open and closing cheerleading you know i don't know if that's a good co-mingling space with the library is normally it's normally quiet normally people want private time want to be focused so i guess we'll explore that with the question to the director but i understand your sentiments about the plumbing issues affecting or shutting down the library um so yeah I think particularly it's housing issues but you're right i think you're i think you're right there could be you know problems with a variety of uses i think we just need we can't just say oh yeah co-mingle co-mingle how you know anything with libraries it has to be thought out yeah and i think that uh part of the conversation i've been observing is the need to build more amenities for the community but dc doesn't have a lot of land left right and so in my dollar deals yeah they're trying to uh maximize the space by going up with air rights and co and co uh mingling projects to get a more bang for our, our buck. And so, you know, in some spaces it may work, some spaces it don't, but that seems to me to be the theme and the, and the drive behind us going into that direction. I uh, wanna jump real quick uh, to Mr. Patterson. Uh, since the library was in this first state for electrical updates, electrical updates, uh, did this work ever get accomplished? Um, can you speak to that? 
It has not uh, been the reason uh, it has not. And I asked uh, Martha Sacaccio, the director of community engagement about this last year. She said, well, because uh, since the new library is planned uh, starting fiscal year 2027, figured it wasn't necessary. And how long has it been like that? Well, this would be the third year that it wouldn't be in the budget, assuming that it won't be in the budget again for fiscal 2024. Um, and I have no idea. Well, there was a mini makeover that cost about a million dollars that was completed in 2016. For which library? For Shepherd Park. Okay. But you said that makeover didn't include address the issues of the electrical problems. As far as I know, no. It was more of a cosmetic rearranging of spaces. Okay. Uh, okay. Here we're talking infrastructure for buildings. Okay, got it. Just want to get some clarity on that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, one of these, um, what they call it a systems refresh, would require the library to be closed for a number of months to get all this work done. Okay. Let me ask Mr. Israel real quick. Um, one aspect, um, I guess, regarding Manor Park, Brightwell Park is in a, is a location. Um, and I heard you say that the residents did not suggest that, or the ANC did not suggest Walter Reed. Um, so do we know how they came up with that location? Uh, well, that's simply uh, the leadership of the libraries that came up with that location. That's a great question. I mean, that, that's my assumption, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I, I think the library just came up with that as a location because it's undergoing so much redevelopment currently and for the next couple of years. Um, but, you know, having said that, well, the Kennedy Street corridor, you know, the zoning regulations on the books would allow for a new library to be built. Um, and there are some um, nuisance properties or potential nuisance properties uh, underway along that corridor that perhaps the district government can use eminent domain on to put a new library or just purchase the property outright. So there are opportunities on Kennedy Street to build a new library. It doesn't have to be Walter Reed, but that did not come from us. So I assume it came from the library leadership. I'm also concerned about the community engagement piece that's been uh, discussed as well. And this survey uh, is, is not being a, you know, a more comprehensive tool to gather information and get input from the community. Um, and I'm concerned that you all, I guess you had ANC 4D sent the letter and haven't gotten a response yet. So I'll be asking about that as well. Um, okay. I want to uh, go to uh, Ryan Lehman. Um, you, you talked about using space at the bus lot, but you said there's another space that may be available. What was that other space? I heard you say the Cromwell School lot was the bus lot, and you said another space. Was I correct in hearing that in my notes? The trailer that is sitting next to Cromwell School. Um, it was where they planned on bringing, uh, making the entrance for the buses. Oh, what's, um, what's, you know what street that is? Kendall Street, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a, a trailer there with an air conditioning. Um, I don't know, the, don't know if the condition is, but in the meantime, I know that the, the clubhouse here uh, on Central Place uh, could accommodate uh, library services. Wow. This is a little off topic, but for you and the ladies that's in the room, there was a, a building at the corner there. I think it was in the corner of Kindle that was having films coming from there. Do you know if that has been addressed yet? I see they has a new buyer of the other properties behind it. I went past there uh, about three weeks ago. I didn't smell anything that day, but I know the day I was there, I did. The first. Uh, so that's over on. Uh... Fenwick. That's Fenwick. Fenwick and Capital. Um, so on the opposite side. Uh, but I, I just walked by yesterday um, and it's not the chemicals coming from it. 
So yeah, separate issue, but yeah, there's there's many things that need to be addressed that have gone on for far too long in IBC. Okay. All right, I'll send some one back over there. Because I was just over there. I know this doesn't have nothing to do with this, but since you're here. Um, I did want to ask um, about activating our additional resources in the, in the interim. Um, have you all given input to that, and how is that coming along? Given input, as in for for these services, I, I mean, this I think would be yeah, because because part of the agreement, part of the conversation was that uh, in the interim, waiting and for these amenities to come uh, for not just libraries but recreation, there will be some interim. Uh, things done to activate the spaces in and around that area. I even heard that the basketball lights was out, things like that, but I'm not sure what's happening in the interim. Yeah, I, I mean, the only program that I've seen uh, over the summer was a basketball tournament that was not organized by DPR. Um, I think they, they might have co-sponsored it, but it was not organized by them. Um, it was interesting because there wasn't, um, there, were, there were teams from around the city that had come to play. Um, but no team had been organized by Ivy City. Um, so it was something that we were given like a week heads up, put together a team and get your kids ready to play a team that's been practicing. So um, we, we did attempt to play a couple games. The kids were a little, a little defeated by playing a team that had practiced for months together versus yeah. a team that just had been come together. I mean, most of the times when the kids are playing on the court, they're playing uh, – different games that are not five on five. So it, the rules, again, need to be understood by, by the kids before they can be playing in an organized league like that. I, I thought the idea was was good. Um, I thought it was short notice and it didn't seem to, to really go to the Surviving City. It was just more of an, a host location. Um, I, I, I mean, for interim programming, I, I, I have seen some stuff organized for day events um, or to get information from different services around the city that are hosted at the Cornell School um, lot. Um, and they, we have good turnouts. Um, again, it, it's something that's gonna be more directed for the children. I think, uh, yeah, you, you did those bounce houses out. You, kids, kids come out for those things, of course. Um, free food, I know, is a, a huge hit for the kids too. But it, just whatever you can do to, to continue to raise awareness to Ivy City and the lack of programming that we do have currently, um, truly the only uh, only consistent programming that we're seeing is is done by our DC at this clubhouse, okay. uh, where, where people can come and get food for free every every day. And that's gone on for the last two years, so I appreciate Commissioner Rhodes running that and, and our DC's funding. Got it. I think I'm over my time. One last question for you. Is the community in general support of co-locating a rec and a library in the same location? What is the sentiment from your perspective on the community? Every time we do any kind of polling, it seems that a lot wants to, a lot of people want to see a lot at the site. Um, library is usually up in the top three. Um, so I, I, whatever we can do to maximize that space and maximize the offerings. Uh, and I mean, the two acres can, can be used for a lot. Again, given it's a historic building, um, that's gonna confine what is inside. Um, I know that the, the courts and the play space um, are, are great as long as they continue to be. I mean, the lighting is, is definitely something needed. Once they put up the canopies, it is exceedingly dark there. Um, I used to walk through just to, to run to the market if I wanted to get something there. Um, it's, it's not necessarily something my wife feels comfortable now walking through because it's so dark. Um, and I, and it, it's weird because the two lights that are, are sitting that are over the basketball court and the play space, they don't turn on like the rest of the street lights. Um, and I know that's something that Commissioner Rhodes and myself prior, uh, whenever I was uh, ANC, uh, fighting for the lighting is going to be the is going to make sure the kids are feeling comfortable and safe. Got it. And so I did, and also, Chris, I did get your note uh, from the architect on MLK Library from Francine Hubin states, I never thought it, for public record, for those who can't see it, it states, I never thought it would be a good idea to add residential volume on this particular public building, a library, 
a housing building has a different ownership, maintenance, and sustainability issues that a residential than a residential building in the end. DC libraries canceled that idea and changed direction. I think it was a good decision on the part of the city. Um, so thank you, guys. Um, Matt, do you have anything, Councilmember Fruman? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you very much, Chairman White. Um, I think you've covered it between you and Councilmember Lewis George. You've covered it very thoroughly. All right, great. Thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Um, please note that your concerns is not falling on deaf ears. We still will we'll continue to chip away th at this every day and um, hopes to ask the right questions. And they say if you ask the right questions, you can get the right answers. And you have definitely been strong advocates for your community. I know there are thousands of people who will be benefiting from your advocacy and probably don't even know what's happening. But we appreciate your voice and, and holding us accountable because the reality is we work for you. Um, we are transitioning to the government witnesses. Uh, we can elevate the director. Thank you, guys. Um, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Good afternoon, Director Gavilan. Hello, Council Member White, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. Uh, we're gonna jump right into it. As you know, it's the uh, practice of this committee to sway in all government witnesses. You can start by raising your right hand. Um, and any other persons that's in their fiscal pass in the government should, should also be sworn in as well and should uh, cut their screens on and unmute their mic. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give today uh, is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. All right, thank you. Um, so Director Reyes Gavin, you can start with your opening testimony. Um, great, thank you. Um, and good afternoon, Council Member White afternoon. and members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries and Youth Affairs and staff, <clears throat> excuse me. I am Richard Reyes Gavilan, Executive Director of the DC Public Library. I'm pleased to deliver testimony regarding the library's performance in fiscal year 22, accomplishments in fiscal year 23 to date, and plans for the year ahead. 2022 was a challenging year for DC Public Library and the most challenging year of my 27 year professional career. All the great programming and important services that I'm prepared to discuss were overshadowed by the death on August 4 of one of our colleagues. We mourn the loss of Officer Morika Mannion every day and continue to process the grief from that horrible tragedy. I'd like to begin my testimony today by recognizing the DC Public Library Public Safety Team who, despite working with heavy hearts, continue to show up every day throughout the year, helping to keep staff and visitors to our library safe and welcoming to all. <clears throat> As Washington DC continues to adjust to life during a pandemic, the library continues to welcome back visitors to our buildings, in addition to serving vast and growing numbers of residents online with eBooks and other virtual services. In FY22, there were 2.54 million visits to DC public library locations. And while that figure represents a significant increase from FY21, during which there were months long COVID related closures and service disruptions, it is still well below the 3.82 million visits from FY19, the last pre-pandemic year. That 34% decrease in visits from FY19 to FY22 is alarming and it's happening in libraries all over the country. The San Francisco Public Library has seen a 45% decrease in visits. San Diego, a 53% decrease. Baltimore, a 44% decrease. Prince George's County has experienced a 62% decrease. We are really seeing it everywhere. Furthermore, through the first quarter of FY23, with the exception of a 64% increase in visits to the MLK Library, the overall numbers of visits to neighborhood branches across the city are not significantly better where com when compared to the first quarter of FY22. The uncertainty associated with future physical use of libraries is the primary reason 
we are updating our facilities master plan this year. Published in 2020 with data from 2018, the library's plan recommends a wide variety of projects to maintain, adapt, or grow the library's physical campus. For the time being, considering the trends we're seeing in library use, with no assurances that these trends will reverse, we need to be very cautious about seeking to grow the campus. At this time, I am recommending to my board and to the mayor that DC Public Library should continue to prioritize those projects that are currently funded in the library's capital improvement plan, including the replacement of Parklands Turner, Deanwood, Rosedale, Northwest One, and Shepherd Park. But I do not think it's a good idea um, or good use of taxpayer dollars to seek funding for additional library buildings until there is clear evidence of significant increases in visits to our existing libraries. We look forward to analyzing new census data, monitoring the future of remote work, the future of in-person meetings and other behavioral shifts that have occurred since 2020, and we'll continue to keep the committee informed of our findings and our recommendations. Last year, the circulation of library material, that's checkouts and renewals of library books, eBooks, and streaming content was its highest ever, thanks to increases in the, in the use of both print, but especially electronic materials. 6.3 million items borrowed in FY22 represent a 27% increase in use over FY21, which itself was a record for DCPL and one of the successfully accomplished goals of our strategic plan. Residents who during the pandemic became accustomed to downloading eBooks from Overdrive, listening to music on Freegal and viewing movies on Canopy, all from the comfort of their homes, continue to use those services in record numbers. As with our study of physical visits to libraries, we will continue to monitor how the growing use of online services will impact how libraries are used and where we need to make our investments. The library is proud of its many program highlights in FY22. We continue to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library with signature author programs, including conversations with Pulitzer Prize winning authors, Colson Whitehead and Nicole Hannah Jones. In April, we hosted civil and human rights activist, Andrew Young. DC Reads, our One Book, One City initiative featured a month's worth of readings and discussion of Clint Smith's How the Word is Passed, a phenomenal reflection on the legacy of slavery. All these well-attended programs were conducted in partnership with the DC Public Library Foundation and helped to support businesses like Loyalty Bookstore in Petworth and Mahogany Books in Anacostia. The library hosted large festivals and conferences at MLK and across the branches throughout the year. Each November, GoGo -Go Preservation Week provides the library the opportunity to work with musicians, GoGo -Go enthusiasts, researchers, and others on promoting DC's official music and building the library's growing collection of GoGo related artifacts. In April, we hosted the DC History Conference, welcoming hundreds of residents to convene and learn about the city's rich past from dozens of the district's important historical repositories. In June, our libraries hosted conversations, tours, and receptions with library workers from around the world at the annual conference of the American Library Association. In September, the library worked with the Department of Small and Local Business Development to plan art all night. Musicians, photographers, and other visual artists promoted, displayed, and sold their works in celebrations at MLK and a number of branches around the city. The last thing I'll mention specific to the MLK library from last year is the opening of Marianne's Cafe in March, operated by our good partners at DC Central Kitchen. Great food, excellent coffee, reasonable prices, and a phenomenal customer service and an honorable mission have resulted in Marianne's being the most popular spot in the entire building. We're so thankful for this great partnership. DC Public Library continues to be a leader in the provision of technology and technology training in the district. In FY22, we leverage federal funding received through the American Rescue Plan or ARPA to prepare residents to thrive in a world that continues to move online. One significant ARPA project was the introduction of digital navigators, staff members who provide direct support to residents needing to complete digital tasks, such as filling out job applications, benefits applications, and social connectedness. Since June of 2022, the navigators have been offering regular services at the Anacostia, Benning, Mount Pleasant, Petworth, Shaw, and MLK libraries. I'd like to thank the mayor and city council for funding the, con the continuation of the digital navigators with local funding in the library's budget beginning this fiscal year. 
A second major ARPA project still being implemented is the Devices for Residence program, launched in collaboration with the Office of the Chief Technology Officer. With additional funding from the DC Public Library Foundation and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, DCPL has coordinated the purchase of 10,000 internet-enabled Chromebooks for residents unable to access such devices at schools or libraries. Starting in August, we began distributing devices through partner agencies such as the Mayor's Office on Returning Citizen Affairs, the Department of Aging and Community Living, the Department of Human Services, and the Child and Family Services Agency. Before distribution, we load the devices with an introductory video and library services content. This program conceptualizes part of DC's Tech Together partnership, supports the district's pandemic recovery efforts, and reaches residents who have barriers to, access, to accessing traditional library services. As of this week, 5,000 Chromebooks have been distributed. Our signature FY22 initiative, Beyond the Book, launched in February of 2022. Funded by the DC Public Library Foundation through a $2.7 million gift from Jeff Bezos, the initiative targets children in kindergarten through third grade with programs and books that promote the joy of reading and learning. During FY22, 6,600 books and 28,000 pieces of collateral material were distributed, were distributed and 1,495 participants were registered. Featured books in FY22 include Ezra Jack Keats' Snowy Day, Matt De La Pena's Last Stop on Market Street, and Jerry Pinckney's adaptation of The Lion, of the Lion and the Mouse from Aesop's Fables. Moving on now to DC Public Library Capital Projects, the highlight of the year was the opening of the new Lamont Riggs Lillian J. Huff Neighborhood Library that opened on June 27, becoming the 22nd location that DCPL has rebuilt or fully renovated since 2009. The 23,500 square foot library, two story library, I should say, includes a discovery zone for children and infants, more space for gathering and collaborating, including several meetings and study rooms, and outdoor spaces with seating on each floor. The library is named after Lillian Huff, a prominent Ward 5 resident, organizer, and activist who fought to secure funding for the original Lamont Riggs Library. In its first three months, the new library had 21,000 visits. Additional capital project highlights this year include the design completion of the Southeast Library renovation and expansion. The building, always one of DCPL's busiest, will double in size when it reopens. We hope to close the building for construction later this summer. We also look forward to beginning design on the new Congress Heights Library on the St. Elizabeth's campus in Ward 8. We're thrilled to once again be teaming with Perkins and Will and Turner Construction the same team that delivered our Southwest Library. And speaking of the Southwest Library that opened in 2021, I'm proud to say that it has won 19 awards and counting for design, construction, or sustainability, including the Chapter Design Award from the DC Chapter of the American Institute of Architects and the Climate Champion Award from the US Green Building Council. We also look forward to advancing new mixed use library projects in Chevy Chase and Deanwood, Small capital projects in Shaw and Petworth will also get underway this year, resulting in renovated facilities that are more responsive to the needs of their respective communities. Before moving on from our current capital projects, I think it's important to add that we are seeing a lot of volatility in the construction market that will invariably result in rising construction costs. Whether related to materials, labor, or other factors, we are working with our design build teams to manage escalating costs as much as we reasonably can and we'll continue to work with the mayor's office to refine our budgets as we get additional information. Looking years down the road, DCPL continues to consider the future of the Shepherd Park Juanita E. Thornton Library. Last month, we issued a survey to library users and community residents to gauge their interest in relocating the library to the Walter Reed campus where visitors may have additional access to a nearby supermarket and other amenities. The survey will close later this month at which point we will proceed with next steps based on our findings. Um, I should say that um, I'm thankful to um, Council Member Lewis George and her team for helping to promote that survey uh, through her channels, which is super helpful. In addition, this coming year, we look forward to launching a survey of residents who live close to our current Northwest One Library to determine the types of city services they would find useful in the existing 5,000 square foot space that DCPL plans to vacate Eventually, we continue to discuss possibilities for that existing space with partner government agencies. 
As I wrap up my testimony this afternoon, I wanted to call attention to some of the library's internal initiatives worth noting in a public hearing. Following my commitment at last year's oversight hearing to create a new DCPL space naming policy that would include meaningful community input, I'm proud that on August 3rd, 2022, the DCPL Board of Trustees voted unanimously on a revised policy for naming spaces and programs and for donor recognition. A few important changes to the revision include that the library will not recognize any donor through the naming of a space. Rather, donors will be recognized on a donor wall or in marketing materials. In addition, the public will always be given notice of a naming proposal and be given opportunity to provide feedback. Another initiative worth mentioning briefly here is the work done to help unify, guide, and inspire library staff. Building on goals identified through an extensive talent management review, DCPL developed and launched a purpose statement and, core val and a set of core values. The values support the achievement of individual and agency goals and provide a framework for rewarding and recognizing DCPL staff. Developed by a dedicated team of colleagues from across the agency, this work lays the foundation for an improved workplace culture that will allow us to better serve our customers. We also hope that it will help us grow our staff, keep them longer, thereby slowing the turnover that organizations everywhere seem to be experiencing at ever growing rates. I'd like to close as always by offering my thanks to the committee for inviting me to testify. I'd like to thank the library's board of trustees for its guidance throughout the year, all of our library friends groups and the DC Public Library Foundation who all add immense value to our work in the community. I'd like to express my appreciation to Mayor Bowser and her, her administration for their work with us throughout the year. Finally, I extend my appreciation to the staff of the DC Public Library who continue to work hard under trying conditions. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Director, for that um, extensive testimony and some of the great work you are doing across the city. Um, I have a number of questions, which we'll dive right in. Um, first, I want to start off. I, I assumed you watched the previous panel of witnesses. Yes, with great interest. And uh, one of the one of the statements was made about uh, from Chris Otter about the his opposition to co-locating libraries and housing. Yes. Um, can you give us a reason why we should, uh, based on some of the work you are doing in libraries? Because I see that's the direction the city is going in. And I should say, council member, it's not only the direction Washington DC is going in, but it's a direction that cities across the country and Europe and all over the world are growing in to promote smart growth of cities. Uh, the mayor and the council have ambitious housing goals. And um, you know, considering we only have 67 square miles of space in the city, building up is really our only option. I particularly like density because it creates a built-in usership for our branches. And so um, the West End Library, we do know that there was a five-week closure because of a leak. Frankly, there could be a leak in any building for any reason. We've had leaks in our libraries that have nothing above it. Um, you know, these, are, these things happen. We work to prevent them from happening. But I'll say the West End Library has been open for six years, one of the busiest libraries in DC, great staff, a community that loves it. So I will always be in favor of additional density. You know, I grew up in New York City where every inch of space is a premium. And so, you know, we think density contributes to smart growth, um, environmental good habits and, um, and safer, safer streets. Thank you. Do you see other, any other reasons why we, sh or potential issues with co locating these spaces and also what's your thoughts on co-locating co spaces for libraries with recreation centers? Um, you know, I think, again, I'm a, I'm a fan of co-location. I think the more density, the easier it is for residents to do multiple things in one visit, whether it's go home, go to a supermarket, go to, a, you know, go lift weights at a, in a rec center. If you can all do that in, you know, without having to go to four different places, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, as I've mentioned before, council member, um, the reason that our co-located facilities don't currently work that are co-located with rec centers is that those spaces are frankly too small. We don't have community spaces. We don't have study rooms. We don't have conference rooms. 
um, we don't do enough of those things in those spaces that we can do in our bigger libraries. But it's not it's not the co-location that's the problem. It's the it's the frankly it's the space of the library and the services that we cannot provide. Okay. Um, and as you know, I'm a strong advocate for youth and young adults in the city. Um, and I, I did see that you all have the teen council and I uh, uh, noticed there were eight members, I guess one representing each part of the city, each ward. Um, can you speak a little about uh, what is the goal of this teen council and what and is it going to span what, uh, what they are doing? Yeah, so the, the goal of the teen council in some ways mirrors the goal of the uh, the summer youth employment program. You know, we want to uh, bring in teens to do a couple of things. First of all, we want to get them acclimated with the world of work. For many of these kids, this is the first time that they're going to be showing up. They're going to be reporting to a supervisor. They're going to be filling out a timesheet. They're going to be given tasks. They're going to be given instruction on computers, things of that nature. So that's great. I mean, that is creating a workforce at a very early age. Um, what I love about the teen council is that, you know, that's an audience that the council members, the teen council members um, help us reach teens where otherwise we may not be able to reach them. Um, you know, I'm the father of a 16 year old. I'm the last person she wants to speak to about just about anything. So it's great to have teens who can talk to teens about the so sorts of programs they want, how they can be helpful to the library. They can be advocates in their schools. It's a, it's a great tool by which we can amplify our services, um, give teens a paycheck, and hopefully create lifelong library users. And we are expanding the program um, thanks to help from the DC Public Library Foundation. Uh, we have added or are also adding um, four, more, four more teens to the council. So we've got now uh, 12 members of the, uh, of, the, of the teen council. Got it, okay, great. Um, there's a sense of conversation probably for the last three years um, about Brightwood Park. Um, and the recreation centers there. Um, and I know that there's a proposal to put one uh, at Walter Reed. Now, who, who came up with this? Um, uh, the, the, the Walter Reed development has been um, talking to the library ever since I moved to Washington, DC in 2014. Um, the fact that there's so much density going on to the campus, the fact that there's a supermarket and other amenities, it is sensible as we do our, um, as we explore the surrounding area, it is sensible for us to evaluate whether it makes sense to move the Shepherd Park Library a short distance to the Walter Reed campus. What is your definition of a short distance? Um, well, I, I mean, it's, I don't have the exact distance, but I think it's probably less than three quarters of a mile, but that's from the existing library, but that's assuming that the existing library is in the best place to serve Shepherd Park residents and other residents, and I'm not sure that's, that's the case. And I, I have a lot of questions related to this, but I see we have Council Member Janice Lewis-George here. She can chime in. I did one last question for me. Um, I guess the commission ANC 4D sent the letter that you heard about during the testimony. Can you give us a reply back? If you reply back, what was the reply? Uh, did you get the letter? The staff is there. Someone got the letter. Yeah, you know what? And if Mr. Israel is there, I honestly do not remember right now if I responded to that letter. Um, I will say I'm happy to respond to that letter. And I'll, I'll say just in in and maybe I'll answer the one of the Brightwood Park questions um, at right now. You know, our, our goal through the facilities master plan and, and the recommendations of the facilities master plan wasn't an automatic, let's build new libraries everywhere we've identified a service gap. Um, we say in the facilities master plan that we have to do more studies, we have to do more evaluation. One of the theories that we had was, could we move the Shepherd Park Library further to the south to better serve residents to the south, including Brightwood Park, Manor Park. Whether or not that is possible, the fact that we have many neighborhoods to speak to, right? I mean, Brightwood Park wants uh, library services according to some of the people that testified. Ivy City uh, wants library services according to people that testified. I mean, there are probably 15 neighborhoods in Washington, DC that 
would want a new library if we went to go talk to them, right? Um, Columbia Heights would probably want a new library. Crestwood will, I mean, so there's a lot that we can do. Um, and first and foremost for me is checking off the, the boxes on the library's facilities plan, revising it, considering all the information that I presented to you during my testimony, and then seeing where the dust settles and seeing what we actually need, presenting that to you very transparently, and Council Member Lewis George, the entire council, the mayor and my board, and then again, using data for a more measured approach. The fact that we've got a 34% decrease in visits to neighborhood libraries, and greater in some places, you know, the Shaw Library, we're seeing a 54% decrease. Um, at Shepherd Park, we saw a 50% decrease from 2019. Um, you know, I think that this is a really good time, council member, um, to be thoughtful about, about what we do, um, where we wait, and how we grow. We're not saying that we're against growing libraries. I have been a lover of libraries for my entire life. You will not find a more dedicated librarian in this country um, than me. Um, however, I do think based on what I'm seeing and what my colleagues are seeing from around the country and even in Canada, we've got to just be measured. I mean, we always want, we always say we want to use data to make informed decisions. The pandemic was not factored in that facilities master plan, and it could be a um, transformative change to how people use libraries. Thank you. And I, I think about that as a as a native Washingtonian growing up here, and I think about what drew me to libraries. And one of the things that drew me to libraries was, was the staff. Was the grandmother. Yeah, was the staff, was the community, my grandmother. Also, I remember William Lockridge actually had programs at the library, at the old Washington Highland Library, which is now the William Lockridge Library, um, which, you know, got, got, had some fun things in the library that drew us in. And if you know that the pandemic is having uh adverse effects on not just libraries but workplaces spaces restaurants hotels all across the country so i mean look at you know we're meeting we're having a, a hearing online um you know we're seeing decreased use of our meeting rooms because people are still meeting online you know is there any commitment that they're not going to start meeting online i mean these are the things that we frankly need to know before we start making you know um commitments i mean we don't even know what type of program we need we don't know how much space we don't know what 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 amenities. I mean, I think that this is really a time to study and make decisions based on what we learn. Yeah, and I do know that I think that council member Janice Lewis George mentioned that there was a pop-up or someone mentioned there was a pop-up in the community in which a lot of people attended. So there's still an appetite. And you know, the I mean the achievement gap for kids across the district uh, has widened during the pandemic. So we do have a need to make sure not just addressing youth services, but just adult services too, as it, as it relates to literacy. Let me jump into this question because um, one of the recurrent things that we're hearing over and over again is around public safety in libraries. Um, I, I do believe that you all had credible messengers uh, at one of the recreation centers, um, which was, which was it? I don't know which, exactly which one it was. So I want to think- it's South, South, Southwest Library. Now, now how, uh, Tell me uh, what measures is the library taking to address security, policing, or public safety, credible messengers, community members? Uh, what's your plan for public safety in libraries? Um, thanks, um, Council Member. Look, I, I, I will say, and, and I thank uh, Matt, Matt William, Matthew Williams for testifying earlier, you know, the, the, the fear, um, both real and perceived fear of violence, we see it around the city. Um, we read about it every day. Um, every day we're bombarded with it and it is creating a sense of fear. I was at the mayor's um, um, summit for ANC commissioners at the Deanwood Rec Center a couple of Saturdays ago and you heard it from every ANC. Direct them a little over my time. Oh, I'm if, sorry. If, if um, you can dive right yeah. into the answer. What is the plan for safe public safety for the recs? That'd be helpful so I can get to the next panel. I don't yeah, know. sure. So you, look, we, we have... have we have added um, FTE for security over the past several years. We're up to 36 FTE um, for public safety. Again, is that enough? I think we, we always are monitoring um, what's happening in our libraries to see if it's enough. We do what have are these FTEs? Are they security guards? What are they? What are they? Public, safety, PS, public safety officers, yes. Um, you know, we do have better partnerships with MPD. We, you know, we do have the credible messenger program at Southwest. 
Um, we have no plans to expand that right now, but you know we're happy to look at that as um, as um, as we can. We've got peer navigators um, across the library system, um, you know, helping with uh, uh, residents who are at risk of being homeless, who often present behavioral challenges, and that's been helping. And uh, certainly, you know, we've got security technology that helps. I'm not saying that we have, you know, we have it all figured out, but it is something that we're all very concerned about, and we do focus on it pretty intently. Thank you. I'll digress for my second round. Um, I know we have Councilmember Janice Lewis George here. Uh, you can go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman White, um, and good afternoon, Director and uh, staff. Um, I first want to start by um, acknowledging um, first the staff at DCPL Libraries, all of the libraries, but uh, especially our Petworth, uh, Tacoma, Juanita, Thornton. Um, and though Lillian Huff is on the Ward 5 side, it is directly at the line of Ward 4 and Ward 5 and the amazing work they put in and the amazing programming they've done all year. I want to thank your DCPL library on the go-go uh, crew who came to Kennedy Street twice this summer. Um, and we're so amazing with our Ward 4 young people and so patient with them and had such amazing programming. Um, and so many of those young, uh, so many families came out twice to that event on Kennedy Street. Um, it was a great turnout and your staff was amazing. And so I, I want to preface there and, and appreciate the work that, that you, uh, that the staff has been doing on the ground um, and uh, appreciate the staff at MLK Library. We were able to take a tour as a count, uh, council members and be able to be there. And um, we appreciate that. Um, I, I have to say that the situation that has arisen with um, the library at Shepherd Park, um, the proposal for Walter Reed and the lack of engagement um, for our a ANC 4D, which represents Brightwood Park and 4B, which represents Manor Park, um, has left our community feeling um, and our community leaders feeling disrespected. Um, and ignored and perpetuating harm and equality in our ward that does not need to be perpetuated any longer. And so I wanna start with questions regarding first, the service gap that was identified uh, in the next, uh, in, in, in the report uh, that DCPL put out. And director, it is from that report and am I correct in page 33 of that report, uh, you all identify a gap that includes the neighborhoods of Brightwood Park and Manor Park. That, is that correct? That's correct. And you noted that while the area is located between four libraries, Shepherd Park, Tacoma, Lamar, Riggs, and Petworth, the closest one is approximately one mile away. Yes. Uh, it also, you also noted that this area is made up of primarily of single family row houses and other low to medium density housing, housing, and that this area had a high concentration of individuals with low educational attainment, children ages birth to nine, and single in single parent households. And additionally, there are a lot of in, individuals living in that area who do not currently use a library have the potential to become customers? Yes. Okay. Based on what you all identify as a gap and based on your own knowledge of the area, why did you not, why have you not, or did you not within these last two years engage with the Brightwood Park community? Um, council member, we, we, we are trying to stay true to the facilities master plan and the facilities master plan did not, did not indicate, as I mentioned before, that we need new libraries everywhere service gaps have been identified. Uh, it doesn't mean that people don't have library cards. It doesn't mean people are not using the libraries. So, uh, and I, I mean, no disrespect to the community. I think one of the things that we are trying to do in a, in a, in a very measured way is look at the facilities master plan, look at those recommendations, revise it based on some of the startling new data that we are looking at, and then proceeding 
again, in intelligently. Um, you know, I am heartened about the additional outreach that we've been doing uh, to Kennedy Street. Um, I would love to, you know, add more um, outreach to uh, uh, to the area in question. Uh, and I'm also happy to, and we will be engaging um, the community around the the update to the facilities plan. But again, my professional opinion is that that has to take place before we make a commitment to add net new libraries. So the last so the last two oversight hearings prior to, to, to this uh, oversight hearing, we talked about this and you all said that you would be willing to do outreach to the Brightwood Park and Manor Park community. So now I'm hearing that there is no willingness, there was, there's been no willingness within the last two years to do any outreach to the Brightwood Park and Manor Park community. Um, and now it's not in the, because last year, we go back to last year's oversight hearing and we go back to the year before that oversight hearing, you will hear a commitment for engagement, that engagement would happen in Brightwood Park and Manor Park. And, you know, depending on our definition of engagement, some of that outreach that we've done in terms of sending our tech truck and those services, um, you know, that is what we call outreach. Now, if you mean specifically about a new library. No, uh, specifically about a new library. Um, we, we, are, we have not done that, and, and we will be doing that as part of our, our update. Um, council member. What um, and why did you all not respond to ANC 4D um, letter? Um, council member, I'll have to get back to you. I honestly don't remember seeing that letter, but it could well have been an oversight on my part. And as I apologize to um, uh, to Zach, I apologize if that is an oversight on my part. Okay. Um, I also want to understand because you're saying we don't believe that there should be, you're saying no new libraries, but now, but what, what I'm hearing from you is no new libraries unless it's Walter Reed. No. Uh, and well, cause you all are proposing a new library for Walter Reed. So it's not no new libraries. It's just no new libraries for Brightwood Park and Manor Park. We are, are taking the community's temperature on, re, on, on swapping as it were, or building a new Shepherd Park Library at Walter Reed. And we're, we're only gauging the appetite for that. We are not putting our thumb on the scale. We're not saying this is something that we should be doing. We, we really want to take a, a measured approach at whether this is something that the community would like. Because I frankly have heard that some members would like it. And so we're just trying to gauge that. And again, thank you for your help in getting that in that out. But you see how un, un, how it comes off that you are willing to engage the community around Walter Reed, but not engage the communities of Brightwood Park and Manor Park. Do you see the way in which a historically left behind neighborhoods and ignored neighborhoods are still being historic, is still being in the present left behind and ignored? I, and I guess a council member, and it's not that we're showing preferences that we, we have an existing asset at, with the Shepherd Park Library. And we need to make a decision um, about what, if anything, is gonna happen to that building. And that has to take precedence. We, we have to make a decision on that before we- Would, it cost, would it cost more money to purchase a, to, to create a brand new Shepherd Park Library? Would it cost more money than it would cost to keep the Juanita Thornton Shepherd Park Library where it is and give it the upgrades it needs? Um, You know, you can you can renovate libraries for for decades, right? I mean, um, you know, I I think that that library. I think considering some of the libraries that we see around the city, if you go to the New Lamont Riggs Library, the Natural Light, the inspirational spaces, I think that that is not possible in the, Shep in the existing Shepherd Park Library. Um, clearly, doing nothing but but doing, um, you know, swapping out infrastructure, electrical work, HVAC, that is certainly cheaper than building a new library. Right, and it is, it's just replacing, it, it is, it's just, that's, 
that's it. it. It would be cheaper. It would be less money to modernize and renovate it as it is than to build a new, a, a, a brand new state of the art library yeah. there. Understanding that, that it has limitations in the existing space. I mean, it's not, it's, and, it's, yeah. And then speaking of gaps, Director, you know how many blocks away from the parks at Walter Reed Tacoma Library is? It's close. Yeah, we, we know yeah. that. It's yeah. five blocks. Yeah. Five blocks. So and, given DCPL's limited resources, resources, does it make sense to you to place a new library only five blocks away from an existing library location instead of serving neighborhoods where neighbors from your own report, where neighbors have to walk a full mile to access a public library? Well, it's not one or the other because it's not, we're not talking about you're not talking about a swap, you're talking about the an, an additional. Um, so, you know, right now we're more or less compartment, we're, we're separating the two right now. We're determining whether Shepherd Park might be, uh, might be a, a, a better used, a more loved, a, a, a better space at Walter Reed, and whether or not that, that fills any gap to the south, I think- It won't, we, it won't, yeah. it won't. The mile, the mileage will still be a mile, it would still be more than, than a mile for the neighbors of Brightwood Park and Manor Park to get get to the library, and that's fair. And we and with that said, we still have to determine what happens to that Shepherd Park Library. Let me ask you this: Where are you on a two library solution here? What additional resources would you need to open both a modernized or <laughs> relocated Shepherd Park Library and a library in Brightwood Park and Park? Um, you know, a new library right now, it's hard to gauge based on what we're seeing in terms of construction costs. And I don't know if that's going to be sustainable, but, you know, factor in 25 to $30 million for, for a new build. Um, and then factor maybe one and a half to $2 million per year of operating costs. Would you be open in visiting potential sites with with um, the neighbors and team and my team? I mean, of course, but the, the issue there is that you know that then leads to an implied promise, which I certainly can't make. Um, you know, I, I don't have the funding, and I should say again, council member, that based on what we're seeing in terms of uses of libraries, you know, I let me just you know if I can rattle off how much more people are using our online services. Um, you know, how many more people now have devices thanks to programs like the device to residence program that the library is leading, you know, uh, thanks to like direct to home programs like we're doing like books, books from birth, um, initiatives like remote work, virtual meetings, um, even the success of the, the MLK library, you know, I think that that should be understood, well understood before we make a commitment um, for net new libraries. And again, that's why I'm saying no net new libraries. It's not that I'm saying that that should be it forever. DC is finished. I'm saying that we are at a particular time in our history that we have never experienced before, or we haven't in a hundred years since the pandemic. And if, if that's the case, then the survey for Walter Reed is a unnecessary is 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 um then out of order. If if that's the case, and well, not not if if it's but but there we're talking about replacing a library that at some point is going to reach the end of its useful life with something that we think will be better used. I mean, that's the other issue. You know, the, the Shepherd Park Library, you know, remains one of the least visited libraries in our system, um, especially for its size. So one of the things- but that with, we, we just talked about the Walter Reed is building more, more people are coming with Walter Reed. So you're gonna, there will be more traffic to the library for Shepherd Park, for the Shepherd good, Park Library. That's a good thing. Why can a survey? Why can a survey be put in um, A and C four B and four D for Brightwood Park and Manor Park? Why haven't they received a survey for the Shepherd Park Library? No. For for their the potential use of having a library and and whether they would use a library and what a library would mean for their community. Again, uh, Council Member, I think we want to exhaust all the possibilities of the Shepherd Park Library. Remember our our original plan, the non-updated one, proposed 
And I know you've said it can't be done, but the plan itself, and we can't cherry pick what we like from the plan. The plan says that we need to um, explore whether a new library could better serve residents to the south. Once that is exhausted, once those question marks are over, with, once we decide what's happening, then we can take a measured approach as to where, where, I mean, again, you know, Brightwood Park has a service gap. We know there are lots of service gaps in Ward 5. We know there are service gaps. Um, Agree. You, know, you all you all identified the areas that had service gap in, 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 in it. Um, and, and, I, and I agree with you on, on the areas that you've identified. I don't think you need an additional study. If you've met with the neighbors in Manor Park and Brightwood Park, I don't think you need to study anymore whether they need a resource. There is a shooting on Kennedy Street. Uh, you hear about it. We all hear about it. You hear about the things that are happening in our community, there in our neighborhood. So I don't think there are shootings outside our existing. I don't, I don't I don't think there needs to be a study to to identify the need. If anything, the pandemic made the social conditions that you identified in the report worse, not better. It's not like after the pandemic, there's going to be less socioeconomic issues in Brightwood Park and Manor Park. Um you know, granted, and I, you know, I would love to also to think about, you know, what are the services beyond library services that could that could make an impact? Because, again, you know, we're seeing precipitous declines in visits um, across many of our branches, and, you know, it's it's again, I'm, I'm I'm just suggesting that we need time to think about what the future of libraries looks like. Um, I'll tell you just based on my understand, I mean, I don't know of a library system in this country that is looking to create, I mean, yes, they're looking to renovate libraries, yes, they're looking to like fix old libraries, whatever. I don't know of a library system in this country that's looking to build new libraries out of whole cloth based on what they're seeing. That's that's all I'm suggesting, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Lisa Lewis George, would you like to get a second round? If so, I have to jump to Matt Fruman. You have more questions? Yes. You gonna come back to yes. the second? Room? Okay, great. Yes, I will. Thank you, Councilmember Fruman. Go right ahead. Thank you, thank you, Chairman White. Um, I, I may end up needing a second round too because having listened to all the the testimony, it, it raises all kinds of different kinds of questions. Um, I want to start by saying, in a certain sense, uh, Director, I think you're a victim of your own success. I mean, the library system is so fabulous that everybody wants to have it near them. And I can testify to that. Um, we take our granddaughter to the reading program at our library. Uh, my wife runs a program for seniors. She routinely says that the best partner she has to do programming is the library. Last night, I was at a community meeting at the library. It, the library's are are doing such a great job that you have to be sympathetic to folks in every community who think, well, we need to have one. And if they have one in Matt Fruman's neighborhood, they should have one in my neighborhood. And, and uh, just um, the council member, I'm sorry to interrupt, but with all that said, and you know, thanks for the accolades and I couldn't agree with you more, there is the reality of what we're seeing. Um, based on our recent data from FY22, when the library was largely open for business. Um, you know, we didn't really have pandemic restrictions in FY22. So while, you know, you say that we, everyone wants a library, you know, there is a difference of about a one and a half million uh, people that didn't come to the library in FY22 that did come in 2019. And I think that we need to understand that. Yeah, no, and I, I hear you about wanting to understand that. And I wonder on one of the sets of questions or one question is you you show year to year data, but in some places there can be trends within a year. So are you seeing in January of the most recent year that you have data, does it look the same as it did in December, you know, the beginning of the period or at the end, or do we have a trend at all of increasing? Um, Council member, my experience. It's, it's it's not really worth our time to understand what happened one month versus the next. Um, you know, really usage, behavioral changes in libraries are pretty slow, um, except for monumental um, things like, like, like the pandemic. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see spikes or, or peaks or, or valleys 
that you can't account for. But over time, um, you know, you can see a crescendo or 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 a descent. You know, some of what we're seeing post-pandemic are things that we were seeing prior to the pandemic, but at a much at a much more gradual pace, right? So like the advent of eBooks, we were seeing that take over more sort of market share of library usage. Uh, patron place holds, meaning somebody goes to a computer, places a hold on a book rather than go and browsing the shelves. You know, we saw more of what, that was something that was growing pre-pandemic. Now it is something that is a, a, a much larger percentage of how the libraries are used. And that all influences um, our space, our space uh, design, our program design. And, and do you, the reason I ask about the month to month is, I mean, you're right, the world has changed, although we just don't know exactly how. In, in a different setting, in traffic counts, for example, that's a thing that comes up for me um, And as people think about changes to different roads. It, it is changing over time. It has not snapped back, but the there is a trend line. And I just was curious whether there's any kind of trend line here. Another thing that can happen, and you know, the whole ebook phenomenon, the, all of the services that you provide, I, I really, you know, my wife is the biggest booster of DCPL out there. But you, you're probably bigger, but she's pretty close, and she takes advantage of all of those different services. Um, but is another dimension of how you're thinking about this change in usage to think about changes in programming or changes in things that you might offer under the roofs of the libraries that would bring more people back in it, to to what extent is that if, is that in the calculation for you and what kinds of things are you thinking about yeah i mean part and parcel with what people want i mean people may want fewer things from us or may want different things from us i mean that begs the question like you know are our staffing models right you know right now we have a variety of different types of staff. Um, you know, we've been slowly introducing things like, you know, a social worker this year, um, peer navigators, uh, credible messengers. You know, I think that ultimately we will need a more complex staffing model um, to suggest that we may need, you know, more social workers, more, um, you know, more specialists in X, Y, or Z. I think that that's, that's a really fair assessment. Um, you know, it, it gets to the point where like, you know, are we defining, are we, are we defining, redefining libraries or are we no longer uh, defining libraries and defining a, a new, a new value or something to that effect? Yeah, I do think that that is, we're thinking about it. I mean, I'm, I am a very big booster for schools and communities and how schools become community centers and rec centers obviously fit that function, but libraries are, are, have a special place in that kind of pantheon and okay. the and fact I, that yeah i'm sorry I'm, I'm i should not be interrupting you <laughs> it's all good it's a conversation you know there are there are heartstrings involved here and and i see that and i see how passionate people are and i'm that you know i was that kid in the library who was dirt poor and i was that dirt poor teenager and college students um but you know, at the same time, we wear different hats as we get older, and we and we have to wonder, like, you know, could this money be better used doing? Could some money that we want to do, could that be better used to doing some violence prevention programs or something? You know, we work well with agencies across the city. I love taking a hands-on approach. I love the library, but you know, let's let's take advantage of the of what the pandemic has wrought, and let's rethink this rather than just assuming that everything is normal and 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 let's just you know move move ahead otherwise why collect data you know yeah i mean you you collect data about about service gaps and it's a changing world and in so many different things we all we need to take stock of what's it going to look like so i i hear you on that but then you all, that also comes in a context of an acknowledgement of service gaps in certain areas or that pre-existed. Sure. And, and it, even if, if usage is down by a third, if the two thirds who are still showing up are maybe the ones who need it the most, um, then that's a, that's a thing that needs to be thought of too. You know, and it I could be uh, that the people who access the, the e, e resources 
are you know a different population than the people who are relying on the brick and mortar in the same way. I, think I just want to understand for sure. And um, and I look briefly at the report. I'm I'm new to this and see that there were six uh, service gaps that looked like they were identified in that last report. And there's a danger of just responding to the squeaky wheel, but there's also merit in trying to hear from communities. Are other communities in that uh, list of six service gap areas as vocally calling for, for this issue to be addressed as this one here in Brightwood Manor Park? Um, certainly there's been interest from local elected officials and others in Ward 5 um, who are excited about the potential replacement of one of our co-located facilities with a new full service facility just to the north in Ward 5. So that's been um, that's been uh, conveyed to us. Um, but but in that in in your rubric and you interrupted so I'll interrupt you. Yeah, you bet. That's not a net gain. That's a replacement in a sense, and a replacement with a of a facility that the way you talked about it before, those facilities were compromised, and because because they were smaller, they right. they couldn't serve the function. But it's not an it's not the addition of a new facility. It's kind of like what you're talking about in Shepherd Park. Yeah. But go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Oh, and uh, and and recently, you know, some of your colleagues on the council have asked about the um, the service gap in Adams Morgan and Dupont Circle, and you know what I, I've conveyed to them as well. Some of our data, you know, we, we call a service a service gap exists for a variety of reasons, and the service gap there existed because of um, what I called oversubscription of nearby libraries. And what we're seeing is that oversubscription um, no longer exists um, as of FY22 and even the beginning of FY23. So, you know, as I'm saying across the board, I think this requires further study. So, so, and and I think you said that in your updated plan that you that this is a thing you'd be thinking about. My my time is running out, but I I'll just add one more thought that could put me like inside of a a circular firing squad, given the testimony of the different panels. Um, but there is the tandem goal of adding affordable housing and adding housing. And one way to think about looking for new sites is, are there sites where you could kill two birds with one stone? Could you get a library, for example, somewhere in Brightwood Manor Park that you could also get housing and achieve a dual goal and and wh whether that's worth thinking about in the equation yeah my the library board of trustees does not want to move forward on any library project without some complement of affordable housing above Okay, I've run over. I'll, I, I'm going to come back to issues that are in my backyard and take my nose out of other people's backyards in the next round. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll jump back in. Um, Director Gavin, when would the... Uh, site selection study for Northwest One Library be conducted? And also in your answer, can you explain the connection between DC Public Libraries regarding Northwest One? Yeah, so um, we we just got funding in FY23 to begin that site selection process. Um, so we will, we will start that this year. Of course, every site selection is something that we try to do in partnership with other agencies, usually DEMPED. Um, and that's where we are with um, the new Chevy Chase Library as well. Um, in terms of um, the collaboration with the current Northwest One Library Council member, I don't think you've been there, but um, you know, our, our our staff at the library work with the Walter Reed folks. I'm sorry, the the um, the uh, I'm spacing on, on the name. park or no, no, the, the school, the co-located school with Northwest one. 
Okay. In any event, we Walker worked Jones. with Walker Jones. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, so we, you know, the staff at Northwest One reaches out to the Walker Jones School, but I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons that we we want to get out of buildings like Northwest One is it's hard for us to do programming in there. We don't have um, we don't have program rooms. We don't have study spaces. We don't have conference rooms. We don't have really anything in there that um, you know beyond <clears throat> some shelves of books that could engage a, you know, a young mind. So um, the limitations of our work at Northwest One are largely due to the limitations of the facility, which is why operationally it doesn't work for us and why we want um, to, to uh, find a better home. Uh, so what, what would you say is the uses of this compared to other recreation centers like this? Um, Northwest One and the other recreation center libraries are all roughly the same size. And last year, I didn't mean um, to say recreation. I meant to say libraries like this. Right. And th those libraries that are that are connected to recreation centers, uh, Northwest One, Deanwood, and Rosedale. Um, last year, they all ranged in about thirty to forty nine thousand visits per year. Um, prior to the pandemic. Each of those libraries was getting about a hundred thousand visits per year, and that was considered low based on how all of our other libraries performed. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, and I, I heard some of your responses as it relates to where we are as a city and where we are in a still in a pandemic, but not at where we were, but just the relations of people using the facilities. And I just want to be careful with that because that can also be justifying and closing down recs, uh, shrinking the budget of D DC public libraries and putting that elsewhere, going to more digital. And so, you know, while I hear the justification, I'm also, and, and what's happening across the country, I'm also conscious of where we are as a city and trying to make sure we are doing everything we can um, to reach those residents who need our services. And, uh, you know, and I hear the sentiments of Council Member Janice Lewis George and residents, and I think it's imperative that if we saying that recs are not getting traction, and we hear residents saying we need some traction over here, come see us. Where's our survey? We're over here. We want recs. I think we have to figure out a way to address those needs. And you know, it does concern me that you know we are focused on building a new rec in a community that's, that don't even have. It's not even thriving at the moment, um, but we're not, you know, having that same intentionality um, with those residents who've been here and live here currently. And that, that's concerning. I know that's not all on DC Public Libraries um, and it's on the, and the comprehensive plan, but we have to take great weight and figure out ways to stir that ship because we say we're following the plan to this end. And then we're saying we're not following the plan on this end, thinking about moving out of a place. And that's, you know, it's a room for adjustment and we want to make sure we're flexible in our leadership and adhering to the needs of the residents in the district i just wanted to say that i hear you council member and i agree with you you know i'm not here to like sound alarms that you know we're ready to close up shop you know we did have 2 million 2.5 million visits um last year and to council member fruman's point you know it's quite possible that um the people who visited the libraries um while less than 2019 may have needed us more. Um, so, you know, it's not like we're looking to close up shop anywhere. Um, again, I just keep on going back to the notion of just better understanding of, you know, what, what is our baseline as we, as we move forward. And, and a point, a point of clarity, um, I, I, I was meaning to say Shepherd Park um, has a library and I think they're trying to move, you, you are trying to move that library to Walter Reed. I'm not sure if I was clear. I, I, should, I, should, I should clarify that, um, Council Member. Right now we are um, gauging the community's appetite for that move. We're not, rec we're not suggesting that it happen. Uh, we're not saying it should happen. Uh, we're, we're trying to gauge whether, whether people want, want it to happen or would like to see it happen or would like to see us entertain that notion. So, and, and to that end, we are still operating a library at Shepherd Park, correct? Of course. 
and they have an electrical issues. What is DTP public libraries doing <clears throat> PGS to address those electrical issues where we currently have services now? We're not having electrical issues, council member. Um, what, uh, what Mark was referring to earlier is that, um, you know, part of our facilities master plan was creating a regular schedule by which we would make infrastructure improvements. And Shepherd Park would be in line for infrastructure improvements that we will not make if we are gonna be closing it down for if we're going to be moving it or if we're going to be building a new one on site. So um, we just have recommended um, sort of pattern for where we would make these changes. But it's not like like, you know, the lights are not working at the Shepherd Park Library. Um, we just have a recommended um, schedule that that we go by and we are not making any changes at Shepherd Park until, as I mentioned to uh, Council Member Lewis George, until we know exactly what's gonna happen there. Okay. So there's no electrical problems. Uh, thank you for that clarity. Not, not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, I did wanna ask about the expansion of summer reading. Uh, and making materials accessible to other organizations that serve children during the summer. Um, I think you noted that. Does DC Public Libraries have a built-in connection with DPR for programs and other uh, targeted youth programs or organizations? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, DPR is one of our great partners. Um, you know, we promote uh, we promote our summer, and, and we. We actually don't even call it summer reading anymore, um, council member, because you know we know for a lot of people that reading is not necessarily the ticket to go into the library. You know we want to make sure that people understand the library is a place where they can sort of flex their curiosity, whether it's through music or um, or or anything that they want to do. But anyway, we um, we promote our Discover Summer program at DCPR camps. Um, DCPR camps made visits to libraries. Uh, we've tabled at events in partnership with DCPS. And in terms of some of the other um, efforts that we can make, you know, a lot of the outreach that we normally do um, took a backseat during the pandemic. There just weren't as many um, opportunities for partnership. But, you know, as people have become more comfortable with doing things outdoors and together indoors, then we will we will we will do more. Got it. Um, what is the library's uh, focus on addressing the the uh, I guess the uh, widening gap um, of literacy rates illiteracy rates in the district? We've we've seen the data coming back from the pandemic, and and our youth are really struggling um, with staying on reading levels. How does you how do you all partner with organizations, entities, schools to help out in any kind of way? I mean, look, I, this is the mission of the library in many ways is what it has been for, you know, 100 years, despite the fact that people are doing different things with us. You know, we want to promote the joy of reading. Um, we don't want to uh, we don't want to inculcate reading as something that you have to do. We don't want to promote reading of books that you don't want to read. You know, we want to um, we want to let kids know that reading is a path to success and reading should be something that you love and something that should bring you great joy. Um, all of our programs stress that. And so it's, it's really just part of everything we do, whether it's an author talk, whether it's a, you know, a visit to a rec center, whether, whether it's a visit to a festival, um, whether it's any of our programs, um, you know, promoting the joy of reading is really central to everything that we are about. Do you all have any relationships with DC Public Schools librarians? I know there's been a huge movement before to remove um, librarians from schools. And I wrote a bill to help support keeping them in and keeping them funded. Um, but I didn't know if you all had any ongoing conversations uh, with librarians in the schools at all. Yes, in fact, we have a formal agreement with DC Public Schools to um, assist with the purchasing of materials for their own libraries. 
Um, we meet regularly with DC Public School Library staff to promote things like Summer Challenge. Uh, we work um, with DC Public Schools on professional development. Um, we will often go out and talk to them about different resources that the public library has that they will then convey to their students. So, um, so that partnership is really, uh, really robust and, um, and meaningful to us. Thank you. I, I do want to note that um, there has been an increase of homelessness in certain areas of the city and the mayor has tried different initiatives. And I think the library has tried different initiatives too. And I think one that we uh, learned about through my staff was about coffee and conversation and care, care kits, yep. um, especially around the Martin Luther King Library. And we're seeing an increased number of youth who are homeless and in schools. Um, can you speak to what that is and what your goals with that? Yeah, so um, just in general, libraries are trying to be better, uh, better public servants to our customers experiencing homelessness. Um, that's been a pretty dramatic change from 20, 25 years ago, where somebody experiencing homelessness might come into a library, um, you know, staff might look the other way, and there would be very little attention paid to them. You know, now we've sort of leaned in, uh, we do programming that is, you know, we don't say a like a program like Coffee and Conversation, you know, we don't say this is for people experiencing homelessness, but I think that people understand that, you know, programs like Coffee and Conversations really are about promoting people's dignity, giving them agency, um, giving anybody who walks in off the street, say, here, have a cup of coffee on us. Um, let's talk about your life story. Let's talk about what's in the news. Um, you know, I'll give great props to um, uh, the library social worker, Jean Badalamenti. She's been with us. Um, almost as long as I've been here, and she's introduced a whole slew of great programming. Um, Coffee and Conversations is one. The care kits, and that we get, um, you know, uh, we use some private funding where we, um, you know, basically if we see somebody who's coming in off the street who basic needs a, a something simple that might make a major difference in their lives, a kit that might have a pair of socks or some deodorant or something, um, you know, that's just it's just common human decency and and the same way we work with the Department of Health to give out COVID tests, it's uh, it doesn't hurt us to provide care kits at our libraries. And of course, we've got the peer navigators and the peer navigators are staff um, who have a lived experience of homelessness, who engage with um, our residents who have who are experiencing or look like they may be experiencing homelessness and we help better connect them to um, to resources in the city to, to you know, get them a leg up. I think you're on mute, um, council member. I can't hear you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I should be an expert at this by now, but unfortunately, I'm still not. Um, of your, can you talk a little bit about of your your five strategic objectives and uh, which ones are most important for you this? this upcoming year? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the library put out a strategic plan in 2016. Technically, that plan is finished, but um, we did have some fundamental objectives in that plan or goals around reading, around digital citizenship, around strong communities, around local history and culture, and around stewardship, meaning how the library functions as an agency. And, you know, they're all still very important fundamental goals for us. Um, I would say that in each of those buckets, I can point to something that makes me very proud. I'll say that um, in terms of the digital citizenship um, goal, um, considering how much money the library has gotten from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act, that that is probably something that we're leaning into maybe more heavily than some of the others because you know, we've got all those devices, those those Chromebooks um, to get out to our community partners, uh, the digital navigator program, helping people again with their training needs, living life online. So that one is important because there's a lot of funding tied to it. But frankly, with local history, I can talk about all the great go-go programming and exhibitions that we've done. Um, 
uh, with reading. I can talk about the Beyond the Book Initiative that is better serving you know, kids who are in kindergarten to third grade, the strong communities. Um, that's how we better use our libraries. I can think of, you know, I mentioned a minute ago, the, the COVID testing that we've done in our branches and the tests that we continue to uh, make available through our branches. Um, the use of this new MLK library um, as, a, as a community resource, you know, I can really just go on and on and on. <laughs> Council member, I'm afraid you're on mute again. All right. Council member Denise Lewis George, uh, you have questions for round three? Uh, yes, and I will I only have a few, so we'll be uh, try to be short and to the point. Um, uh, Director, uh, 1.5 million was put in uh, in fiscal year 23 for improvements to the Petworth Library. Yes. Um, the improvements to teen <laughs> services section, moving the adult and youth services sections to separate floors. Um, when will this? Uh, um, when will the construction begin? Um, and when can the community expect? Uh, for, what can the community expect for a timeline? We are um, um, beginning the selection process for. A design build firm, um, Council Member jo uh, Lewis George. Um, so that design will take place throughout 23. So expect um, the construction and completion in 24. Okay. So the your the design build form is going to um, will be happening this and year. Yeah. This year. Okay. Yeah. And I should say that um, for all of our small cap projects like Petworth and Shaw, we are reserving these projects for. Um, small uh, small local businesses here in in the district, and we think that that's a a great a great um, partnership. Great, and so there won't be um, any interruptions uh, in this year for service to Petworth Library. No, no, there won't be any disruptions in service okay. in twenty three to Petworth. Okay, and are there any other small cap projects in Ward Four? Um, no small cap projects in 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 Ward Four. Okay. Um, wanted to ask, um, uh, when will the uh, survey results uh, be um, available to the public and to my office for the Walter Reed survey? Um, by the end of this month, council member, and we're happy to schedule some time if you want to go over it with me. Um, um, I, I would be very happy to do that with you. Okay. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would appreciate uh, that. Um, and and the same for the community when those results come out to probably have a meeting to share the results with the community and, and talk through the, the results of the survey with the community. That sounds, that sounds right. Okay. Um, lastly, is there a plan? Do you all have a plan? I think you've been speaking of this to, um, I guess the next Libri study has already been complete. Do you, are you all intending on starting a new study? And if so, when do you plan on starting a new study? Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I hesitate to call it a new study, council member, because I think a lot of what's in the plan, I think still makes sense because of the operational challenges, for example, of our co-located libraries, um, because of some of the, um, um, the, the adaptive kind of reuse of places like Petworth. So we really are gonna be focused on some of those projects like Shepherd Park, Brightwood, um, looking at those service gaps. Uh, we are doing that this year. We want to be comprehensive. We don't want to do this, um, you know, overnight. Um, but, you know, our commitment is to have it done hopefully by the end of the fiscal year. Okay. The end of fiscal year. Okay. All right. Okay. And will the new, well, not the new, I don't know what to call it, the update uh, to the study, uh, if is a better term, will that include community engagement? It will include some, um, but it's, and in fact, you know, some of the community engagement we're doing right now will, will contribute to the narrative. Um, a lot of it is going to look at data. Some of the things that we haven't looked at in years, like where are our library card holders um, right now? Um, where could there be more of them? Those, those sorts of things. So there'll be some community engagement, but a really hard look at, um, at data. Also looking at like sort of population projections, like where the, the projections that we used for the original study uh, were before the most recent census. So, um, you know, some of those numbers really, the, we need to kick the tires around those numbers. Okay, okay. 
Um, okay, well, I, I will close out. I, I will say this. Um, if you if you all can gauge and engage with the Walter Reed developers in that community, you can also gauge and engage with the residents of Brightwood Park and Manor Park. Um, and I think a failure to do so um, will and can send a very uh, poor signal um, in perpetuating inequality and harm in, in, our, in our community. Um, and uh, I, I would like to see the ANC 4D, although they are now out of office, ANC uh, 4D was chaired by Renee Bowser. Um, I would like to see some type of answer in respect of the ANC commission um, for them to receive at least some feedback um, because of the work that that commission did um, and, and, and their attempts to engage for the last two years. Yeah. Um, and ANC 4B, which is Manor Park, uh, which is chaired by uh, Commissioner Allison Brooks um, as well, deserves uh, to have some um, response and some engagement as well. Duly um, noted, Council Member, and we'll keep your staff apprised of that engagement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman White. I appreciate it. And thank you to PCPL um, and all of the staff. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. Thanks, Council Member. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Fruman. So um, I, I hope I don't use my whole 10 minutes because I have somebody coming in maybe less than that. Uh, I, and I this is less a question, but more an observation and some context from my perspective. I, I understand the, the conundrum you're in with decreases in usage, um, but I was in a meeting last night and it's a different agency. Uh, with WMATA talking about plans for the Western Bus Garage. And they had told me a time ago that the new Western Bus Garage up on Western Avenue was going to be all electric, zero emissions. And, and frankly, I said to them, you can't do that. I want it, but you can't do that if the Northern Bus Garage is not the same. And, and I don't know that it's because of that, but you know, eventually they made an announcement that the Northern Bus Garage is going to be all electric. And, it, and I thought, okay, that's good. But then somebody came to testify at the, at the meeting yesterday and was unhappy because the Northern Bus Garage folks had wanted housing and mixed use as part of the development there. And now there, that is part of what the plan is at the Western Bus Garage is perhaps to add housing and mixed use. And he said, and you know, very compellingly, why? <laughs> why did it happen here and why didn't it happen and where in my backyard? And in that setting, the explanation is probably timing about what was the, what was going on and it, in what was the context in the two settings, but the pattern's the same. And I want things in my neighborhood, I'm about to turn to talking about it, but there's a pattern where we may get it and Janice's community may not. And then we have something similar here. And so it, it's you're feeling it because of the great job that you do but also because of a sense of a pattern that Jan that Councilmember Lewis George spoke to, and so we all need to be cognizant of that. Yeah, and I, I get it, um, Councilmember. And you know, I should say we're not opposed to growth. We're, you know, that that is not what we're saying. That's not what I'm saying. You know, given my druthers, I would have a library on every corner. Um, you know, beat to CVS as far as I'm concerned. Um, so it's just you know, it's how how do we manage this wisely? That's that's really and, all, all I want to do, and I and I just wanted to be on record of I, I like I said I recognize your conundrum, but let's let's be putting you know let's try to work together in this. It is coincidentally my daughter lives in Brightwood Park, but that's not why I'm doing this advocacy. Um, so different, you know. Uh, one of the witnesses testified that to the need for seventy more employees in the DCPL system, and I wonder. Um, how many vacancies do you have? Is if, if there's a shortage of employees, what's your reaction to that request for seventy employees, and how much of that would be filled by um, filling vacancies? Um, you know, we um, like every agency, we're seeing a 
a lot of turnover. So for every maybe 10 staff last year that we brought on, we lost maybe six um, on the back end. You know, typically we are in the process of hiring 40 people around the agency. Um, and we've got a great HR team. We just had a terrific um, uh, staffing fair just for the library where we interviewed, I believe, or set up 200 interviews, um, doing some on the spot hiring. Uh, I mentioned that we we're trying to do more to um, keep, keep the staff that we have. What are the incentives that we can provide? Um, how do we make the, you know, how do we improve morale when we know that, you know, public service work is hard, you know, it's retail work and retail work is hard. Um, so on average, about maybe 40 vacancies that are in a constant state of being in, of being filled. Um, we did get, you know, um, funding for 18, one, eight additional FTE in FY23 to expand uh, for the additional hour of service that we're now offering four nights a week. Uh, Monday to uh, to Thursday, um, and again, um, you know, it's a little. We just opened our libraries for that additional hour, but you know, I've committed to the deputy mayor and others that we're going to study that additional hour, and um, you know, we're and if we need to make adjustments, we'll make adjustments. We're really living in a in a world that that you can't make decisions on the fly. You you really have to sort of, you know, measure and analyze. And then work with the council and the mayor on what's on what's best. Um, you know, again, seventy staff, boy, you know that would be great. And you know, while you're at it, throw in a, an additional million new books and eBooks. You know, if the sky's the limit, let's go for it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I and I think the others here at the hearing want to be as supportive as possible of the libraries you know it's the old saying that you know the first thing you cut is the libraries is a way of infuriating people frankly and so the expansion of hours uh, i think is an important thing and, yeah. Look, I'll and say that, yeah the council and i'm glad you're uh, you know you're you're new and it's great because you're supportive um you know i've worked in a number of cities in my career and i've got good friends in every city in this country there is not a single city in this country that supports libraries the way Washington D.C. does, from the mayor to the council. Well, well, let's let's keep doing it, and and I want to look for ways yeah. uh, to be doing that. And and it may be that increasing staff who are in a position to do more things, more programming, can draw more people in, and we take advantage of the brick and mortar investments that we've made. So I want to turn to a different brick and mortar investment. Uh, briefly, and that is uh, Chevy Chase, which is one where Councilmember Lewis George and I uh, have shared shared interests. And it was sobering to me when you said about co-locations, how they can be challenging, because there may not be as much space as you want. And and we're we're about to go into a process on the Chevy Chase Civic Core, where we'll be planning for a library and a rec center and other things. And I guess I'm curious how you expect to interface with the public about the library component of it, what we need in that library and how we make sure that that happens in any RFP process. And I would, and I would urge that you work closely with me in my office and Council Member Lewis George and her office on this, but how how are you seeing that process in the next months? Um, sure, and Council Member, let me just preface this with saying that you know my my our, our problems with the existing co locations, um, they they preceded my time being here, and uh, the library was not included in any conversations about those co located libraries. Um, at this point, not only are we at the table, we've also got, as you know, I think for Chevy Chase, $25 million in our capital um, budget for this library. So we can take a much more muscular po posture here. Um, and we've got certain demands, right? You know, we're demanding a 20,000 square foot space with street access. And once that is confirmed, you know, we will absolutely be doing what I think we do best, especially around capital projects, is engaging with communities around, you know, 
What is it that we want to see? And it's really, I mean, it, it goes back to everything that I was talking to council member Lewis George about and you. It's like, you know, this is a time to look at all of our new assets and libraries and decide, you know, we may not need 40,000 volumes and four study rooms. We may need eight study rooms and 20,000. You know, there's so much that we're going to be working with the community on. DEMPED is a great partner to us. They've got us on speed dial, whether it's Martha Sococho, our director of um, community engagement, or myself directly. You know, we're not going to compromise a single iota on this library because I'll speak on behalf of my board. You know, we won't go through anything that is going to compromise the um, the absolute incredible campus that we've built here over the last 11 or 12 years. Okay, well, I'm I'm really glad to hear that. I, it turned out I, I made myself into a liar because I'm going to use my 10 minutes. Because I have one last question, which is uh, in the budget that you have, do you believe that budget is sufficient to account for including underground parking as part of the project that you're doing? Because this is a thing, you know, the, the, the economics of these things are tricky, but, you know, if we want to have, we want to juggle a lot of things here. We want to have a great library. We want to have a great rec center. We want to have affordable housing. If the site, and we need, sufficient green space to and play space to replace what's there now because it's a coveted uh it's a coveted community asset uh but the so it's going to require in my opinion underground parking and where and i think that cost needs to be borne by all three of the players in the in the mix I mean, I'd um, rather not bear any of those costs. At <laughs> but you're not th you're not thinking of the money that's in the budget today as being sufficient to to include underground parking. I mean, if the library were doing a standalone building, and I was corrected that the budget for Chevy Chase for the library is twenty four point two, not twenty five. <laughs> um, you know, if if that were a standalone library, that could in no way could that accommodate subterranean parking. I mean, you know, excavation, the construction costs skyrocket when you start digging underground. So, but of course, because we are talking about a co-location and mixed use, you know, there are likely opportunities where the various partners will be saving money, right? So, you know, I think that that hopefully will all just sort of come out in the wash when we, uh, when we sit down and say, okay, where are we saving? And, you know, who's, who will be responsible for the parking and, um, and, 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 Will the library get its uh, its desired program? So I I hear you on that, but part of my job because it's not it's not all about you and it's not all about any of the players. But part of my job is to not cross my fingers and hope that it comes out in the wash, but to try to be proactive to make sure that we get it right. So but that was it's very helpful. It's very helpful to get the assurance that it's going to be a great library. No compromise on that. It's also very helpful to understand that as you've been thinking about it with your budget, you haven't contemplated paying any portion of including underground parking. Thank you. All right, two minutes over and, and I gotta go because I have another meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman White. Thank you to uh, to the witnesses today. Thank you, Councilman Fruman. Um, Director, um, can you give us an update on the Turner Recreation Center? library i'm sorry i keep saying recreation center i'm sorry library the turner new turner rec the new turner library yeah so um um you know that we uh worked with the city to find a premium location um adjacent to the um congress heights metro station and recently we announced that we have hired the same design build team that built our Southwest library. Um, that's Perkins and Will and Turner Construction. Um, they delivered a phenomenal project for us um, at Southwest. And they're gonna deliver a phenomenal project for us at um, in Congress Heights um, at St. E's adjacent to the Metro station. So we are right now, I think we're doing, um, we have not gone into design yet. I think we're doing some some back end work with the with the design uh, team 
But, you know, we're excited to get that project underway. And, uh, you know, we're going to need your help in getting um, community members to get excited about that project. We need to know what people want from a library. We don't want to deliver a library um, that are providing services and programs that um, the community doesn't want. So, uh, so we've got a great opportunity here, and we're looking forward to kicking that off this year. So I would like to, if we can do a, a joint event, we can promote uh, an input session. That's um, awesome. Love it. We'll do we're that. Hold you to that. Yeah, we'll do that to add value to that. Um, I do know that you all provide services at DC Jail. How, what is What are the services you provide and how is that coming? Yeah, so we started um, services in the DC Jail, I think it was 2015 maybe 2016, it wasn't long after I got here. Um, you know, the, the core of the work is, is delivering books um, to, the, uh, uh, to the inmates in the jail. But of course, we also do programming in the jail. Um, they've participated in summer reading um, in the jail. We've had um, author talks in the jail. So it is something that is, I think, a really important component of our work. Um, uh, because the demand for books in the jail is great. Um, it really is. People want people want um, good stuff to read, to pass the time, uh, to improve their lives and get ready for when they get out. And I think it also helps us that we have such a strong partnership um, with uh, Returning Citizens Affairs to, uh, to continue that, that relationship once they, are, uh, once they are back in the community. Okay, and I, I do, I mean, I don't know if you have a relationship with Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services for the youth. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, we, you know, we've, our, our partnership with um, um, DYRS has been specific to the Credible Messenger Program that we already talked about. But, uh, you know, we are open, provided that there's funding, we're open to having further conversations. I know that there's been talk about um, new beginnings. Um, that might be an opportunity for us. So that is on our list of things to follow up on council member and we can follow up with your staff on that. Got it. Um, there has been a um, significant increase in devices connected to wireless network at the libraries based on uh, some of the information you sent to the committee. And we know that public access and computer usage and I guess photo copy and printing jobs. This is a, a testament to people returning to libraries to some, to some advantage um, for different services. Uh, it, how are we capturing those people to keep them more engaged? And uh, are there other services uh, offered to them once they come in for those type of services? Um, I should clarify, council member, that um, we have seen increases since the beginning of the pandemic, okay. um, which of course, because the libraries were closed, we're gonna see great increases over FY21 yeah. and most of FY20, but our numbers are still down. Okay. Across, like, other than FY, uh, compared to FY19, except in circulation. Um, you know, with that said, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, our technology services are really important. More and more people have devices. Uh, we are giving people devices, so it's important for us to maintain a strong wireless network and provide those business services that we know people need, including free copying and printing. Got it. Um, that's all I have for today, uh, Director. I want to thank you uh, and, and the public witnesses who took time out of their busy days and schedules to uh, come to this hearing and the council members as well and also to your staff. And I want to give a special shout out to my staff who's been on it um, and making sure that we hear and listen to the public and make sure that we assure them that we're working for them each and every day to make DC a more livable, walkable and safer place for them to raise their families. Um, on a final note, if anyone cannot uh, t testify today and would like to testify um, for the official record, you can email the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs um, at ryA at dccouncil.gov. Uh, it will close today. Uh, well, 
I don't know if it's gonna close today. We have to get some clarity on that, but email us. We're added to the public record with no other business before this committee. Um, the committee, it is now 5.03 p.m. and the hearing is adjourned. Thank you, council member.